Hello everybody and welcome to an introduction to ancient philosophy. What we're going to do in this video specifically is just outline some of the basic principles of ancient philosophy, some of the general ideas that we're going to be exploring, and then just give a general roadmap for the kind of things we're going to be talking about over the next series of lessons, the next series of about 20 or so lessons um, relating to this subject. So, as I mentioned, we're going to examine the nature of not just ancient philosophy, but the, the broader subject of the history of philosophy. Because some people would study ancient philosophy uh, in a topic in and of itself, uh, which is what we're going to be doing in this series of lessons, or people will be studying ancient philosophy as part of a broader history of Western philosophy uh, module or topic, uh, which is obviously a lot larger, uh, but will obviously cover things relating to ancient philosophy too. We're going to examine the concept of ancient philosophy. Where does ancient philosophy actually begin? And where would we argue that ancient philosophy ends? Where's the, the, the cutoff point for this subject? And then we're going to explore the significance of studying ancient texts and examining how we see the, the process of ancient philosophical inquiry. Because the way the ancient philosophers did it isn't too dissimilar to how uh, we study philosophy today. So let's begin by talking about the history of philosophy. Going through and examining philosophy of the ancient writers from Plato to Aristotle to Cicero uh, to Augustine will allow us to engage in the study of the history of philosophy. That's what we're going to be doing. And there are different, uh, two different things that we need to uh, make clear, um, first of all. There are two actual studies that we can do. There is the history of philosophy, and then there is the philosophy of history. Now, you might think that these two, just swapping the words around, makes no difference, but it absolutely does. The philosophy of history um, is the study and the philosophical inquiry of this idea of historiography and historicism and, and what history actually is. Whereas the history of philosophy is the historical study of philosophical thinkers, going from um, the pre-Socratics to Plato to Aristotle to Augustine, and if we go further to uh, people like Aquinas and then into De Descartes, and then uh, going further into the early modern, into the modern period, looking at people like Bertrand Russell, uh, Wittgenstein, etc., 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 etc. So this is the difference between these two subjects. So that's something that we need to make very clear uh, at the beginning. We're doing the history of philosophy, not the philosophy of history, which is completely different. To be more specific, this is a study of the history of Western philosophy. It should be noted that philosophy has existed for thousands of years across the globe, from places like the Far East and in the uh, continent of Africa. Uh, and these areas of philosophy have existed in, in the ancient study of philosophy as well. So if one was to be honest and to actually be talking about the full, broad study of ancient philosophy, we'd be covering all of these areas as well. But for this course, this study of ancient philosophy, we will focus mainly on the Greco-Roman period of philosophy, from the earliest thinkers in ancient Greece to the beginnings of the changing uh, nature of philosophy with the introduction of Christianity across the classical world. And as we go into um, the uh, Middle Ages and or the early medieval period of history. This means that we'll be missing out on a lot of historical study of philosophy of other cultures and hopefully we'll come back to that in their own separate courses. I'd love to do a, a, a series of lessons on the history of like the, the Far East, um, the philosophy in, in the Far East and, and African philosophy. That would be really interesting as well. But for the most part, we're going to be focusing on ancient Greek and ancient Roman uh, philosophy for the most part. One may ask what the point is of studying ancient philosophy. We have philosophy today. We've been covering uh, recently things like uh, quite advanced areas of metaphysics, quite contemporary metaphysical inquiry. What's the point in going all the way back and looking at ancient philosophy? What's the point in this study? Well, the philosophy of ancient writers is still relevant today because for the most part, the questions that were asked of ancient philosophers are actually still being asked today. And they're still being discussed today. And they're still being um, philosophized <laughs> today. Um, philosophy while being arguably the first uh, area of scientific inquiry that we've seen, if if we are being accurate, philosophy used to be the, the first science. Pe things like physics and biology used to um, fit into this broad philosophical tradition. That's why when we study ancient philosophy, we also talk about cosmology and we talk about physics. 
and while it is the first science, it doesn't necessarily progress in a way as, for example, physics does. Physics has g develops over and over a period of time with new theories being tested and, and, and studied upon. But philosophy is very, very different. Philosophy doesn't exist in this kind of way. There are still questions that were asked by ancient philosophers like Plato, like Aristotle, like Zeno, uh, who, um, uh, sorry, that are going to be asked today and still have uh, no answers to them. Instead, philosophers will over time contribute to the broader epistemological tradition that we call philosophy uh, and hopefully um, building on the works of uh, previous thinkers. So that's what philosophy does. Philosophy doesn't necessarily disprove theories that existed in the past. There are some theories that existed in the past that are um, a little bit wacky and that we can probably disprove uh, <laughs> and we will get on to some of those uh, when we look at different pre-Socratic philosophers. But Philosophical questions and thought experiments and Socratic dialogues that have existed um, for thousands of years are still very, very philosophically relevant today. And that's why it's important to study ancient philosophy. And to really truly understand philosophy in any great detail, one has to survey the earliest of the thinkers because this is really where the rest of the Western world built their understanding of philosophy. We couldn't have a Descartes or a Wittgenstein or a Bertrand Russell without the existence of a Plato and an Aristotle because these people developed and built upon these studies that we see uh, later on in history. Now that's a very poetic and uh, a, a, a very poetic way of um, describing ancient philosophy, but it is true. It is nonetheless the way in which uh, we study ancient philosophy today. So it's also useful to study ancient philosophy for a number of different disciplines. So, for example, you may be studying philosophy academically. If you have subscribed to this channel, this is probably the case uh, because we are the Philosophy Academy. Uh, and you'll definitely come across all of the things that you'll study in this course and possibly more. And this can be either in their own disciplines. So when you study ethics and metaphysics, you will come across um, Aristotelian ethics and you will come across platonic metaphysical um, questions. Uh, but if you were also just studying the history of Western philosophy as a separate course in and of itself, then you will obviously be looking at the ancient writings as well. One may also be studying ancient philosophy through the historical lens. You might be doing an ancient history course, or you may be um, doing a, a normal history course and be given the option to study some ancient history. And obviously it's better to understand um, this through a historical lens as well, and how philosophical tra traditions have developed over thousands of years. Finally, you might be looking at it through the lens of classics. Those who are studying classics will also um, be given the opportunity to uh, study ancient philosophy as well, because of course, classics is the study of the classical period, the classical Greco-Roman um, period of history. And so therefore, um, it will be uh, useful to study ancient philosophy to better gain understanding of ancient cultures and societies. So how are we going to actually structure this course? Well, we're going to begin actually by talking about one of the later thinkers. We're going to start by talking about Aristotle. And this is because Aristotle wasn't just a philosopher, but he was also an historian who was able to give us insight into some of the early pre-Socratic philosophers. In fact, we use Aristotle's writings, as well as some very small surviving works of the pre-Socratics, to actually have a better understanding of what these pre-Socratic philosophers um, uh, said and believed. And that's where we'll begin in the next lesson, talking a little bit about um, the, uh, the method and the, the documentation uh, that Aristotle did through his um, surveying of the history of ancient philosophy himself. And then we will then start to talk about the pre-Socratic philosophers. We'll start to talk about people like Heraclitus, people like Aximandia, people like um, Thales, of, uh, 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 Thales, arguably the first um, philosopher uh, we can talk about. And then we will move into um, quite the the majority of the subject, which is obviously going to be talking about the works of Socrates and Plato. Of course, we know about Socrates through the works of Plato, and then we can talk about Plato's works in and of himself before examining in great detail the um, the works of Aristotle himself, Aristotelian ethics, um, the political theories of Aristotle, as well as things like logic as well. And then finally, we will look at philosophers in the later ancient period. So f immediately following um, the works of Aristotle, people like um, Cicero will talk a little bit more about Stoic philosophy as that developed through the Greek and into the Roman period. And then we will end by talking about the rise 
of the Judeo-Christian um, developments within philosophy and look at the development of early Christian philosophy ending with the works of Augustine. Now, you could really place an end point for ancient philosophy wherever you wanted. You Some argue that ancient philosophy should end at the point where we see the first century AD. We start to, that's when we see the end of um, uh, ancient philosophy and then we go into the medieval, early medieval period. But for the most part, some people argue that um, ancient philosophy does and could go all the way up to uh, some of the earliest Christian writers, that being the people such as Augustine. Because the influence of Christianity on the later period of ancient philosophy it cannot be understated. And that's why it's important that we talk about that as well. So that's the structure of this next series of lessons. It's going to be about 20, 25 lessons. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this very basic introduction and I'll see you all back for the next lesson, beginning by talking about Aristotle. Welcome everybody back to Ancient Philosophy. In this lesson, we're going to start to look at the pre-Socratics, namely beginning with the earliest of the philosophers that we can really think about, and that being um, Thales. Now, we're going to examine effectively the first of our ancient Greek philosophers, okay? And the next few lessons, the a significant period of um, time actually, is going to be dedicated to a number of pre-Socratic philosophers. We tend to um, split ancient philosophy into some really key periods of time. We tend to look at the philosophers before Thales, you know, uh, sorry, before, before Socrates, that being Thales, that being people like Aximandia, we talk about people like Heraclitus, uh, Parmenides, we talk about Zeno, for example, and then we start to move into looking at the um, Socratic dialogues, we start to look at Plato, and then we look at Aristotle, and then beyond, and talk about um, other philosophers going into more of the Roman and, and Judeo-Christian traditions, people like um, people like Cicero and people like uh, people like Augustine is who we're going to finish with. And so that's what we're going to do. That's basically the general outline for the next few lessons. Okay, so Thales is the first of the ancient Greek philosophers we can think about. It's also interesting in the sense that Thales is often described as the earliest of all the philosophers. Okay, he's the, the founding father of philosophy almost. And we'll both examine the philosophy of uh, Thales and look at his life um, before moving on in next lessons to looking at other thinkers within his sort of circle, uh, his sort of cosmological um, thinkers around his period, and then moving on to other um, schools of thought as well. So, despite the fact that very little is written about Thales. We know quite a lot about his life. At least we know quite a lot that we suspect is the case about his life. Now, you might not think that this lesson is going to be particularly um, in-depth when it comes to the philosophy, and you'd, you'd be right in thinking that, because when it comes to the actual philosophy of Thales, there's, there isn't that much to go on. We have a few key quotes and we have a few key principles that Aristotle describes what Thales believes. And it sort of does exist within this sort of very early, um, very early ancient Greek tradition um, of um, looking at fundamental substances as being um, fundamental for, for all life and all uh, of all of existence. For Thales, this was water. So, but even though we don't know anything necessarily that much about his philosophy, we know quite a lot about his life. We know that he lived from around 625 to 545 BC, and we know that he was an astronomer. We know that he famously predicted an eclipse. We also know he was the first person, or was probably the first person, to prove that a year contained 365 days, being able to identify the um, the, 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 the high points uh, of the sun in the sky, the summer solstice, and, and, and obviously the winter solstice. And he was also able to make a profit out of some of these predictions as well, because we know that he foresaw a, an unusually good olive crop and took out a lease on oil mills, um, which therefore led to him um, ensuing, uh, profiting off an ensuing monopoly that existed. So we know that this is all from Aristotle, by the way. We know that um, this is the kind of things that Thales um, did through his life. One thing we know about Thales is that uh, he was encapsulated um, and uh, encapsulated this sort of traditional understanding of ancient philosophers as in a mixture of, pre uh, of professions. Back in ancient philosophy, we know that the study of philosophy itself was seen as more of a fundamental science. Um, people didn't really distinguish between physics and astronomy and cosmology and biology and, and, and philosophy. They were sort of all seen as one kind of thing under this underpinning of the concept of philosophy, this sort of love of wisdom, which is really where the word philosophy comes from. 
And so when we look at the life of Thales, we see that um, he was somebody who was an astronomer. He was somebody who um, famously was a, a bit of a mathematician using um, geometry to be able to predict the size of the pyramids. We see that he was able to foresee uh, an unusually um, good olive crop and therefore made a little bit of money off that. And we can see that all of these things sort of encapsulated within the realm of philosophy at the time. And it's not necessarily what we would describe philosophy as um, in today's um, standard. We have uh, other words for that. We have words like physics and, and, and astronomy and geology for these kind of things. Our understanding of Thales can be described through the lens of other philosophers. The two main philosophers that have described the life of Thales are Plato and Aristotle. Um, Plato famously describes a story whereby Thales was stargazing, not looking where he was going, and ends up falling into a well. Um, this was a particularly, uh, quite a negative interpretation of how Thales lived as a person. Uh, but nevertheless, we uh, always do think that Thales was always seen as a great thinker within the older traditions of ancient philosophy. And even though we mostly get all of our understanding of Thales from people like Plato and people like Aristotle, we do have two quotes that we can attribute to Thales himself. And these are these two quotes here. All things are full of God. And the second quote being the most important for his philosophy is water is the first principle of everything. So these are two actual quotes from Thales that we know exists. The rest is just um, descriptions from second-hand tales and accounts that are described by Plato and Aristotle. Thales seemed to have stated, uh, sorry, at least started the uh, ancient tradition of viewing water as some kind of ultimate principle of everything. That's what I mean when we're talking about early ancient Greek philosophy seems to have some kind of fixation on basic and traditional substances like fire and water and earth as sort of ways in which we can understand and have a better understanding of uh, of reality. And for Thales, water was this sort of ultimate principle of everything. This is perhaps where um, the philosophy of uh, Thales may begin and end. This might be all of Thales' philosophy. And as we understand philosophy today, that's really all we can attribute to Thales as a philosopher, somebody who, um, you know, took the idea of water as being some kind of ultimate principle. It is said that Thales believed the earth rested on water like a log floating on a stream. And he also uh, apparently said that he believed all things came from and was made out of water. We only truly know about these kinds of details through explanations of his works by Aristotle. Aristotle, um, as such, um, we almost need to view the philosophy of Thales through the lens of Aristotle. Aristotle was quite critical of Thales' work. Aristotle himself would often challenge these fundamental beliefs posited by Thales, suggesting that if Earth rested on water, what did the water rest on? Which is a very good question um, that you could challenge Thales on. Equally, he seemed challenged by Thales' belief that all things came from and were made out of water. And so, really, when we're talking about the philosophy of Thales, and we're talking about um, Thales through the, uh, through the lens of ancient philosophy, that's effectively all we can go on we have more accounts and more details of his um, of his um, people who came after him. And so when we look at other philosophers, when we look at Heraclitus and when we look at Parmenides and Examandia, uh, we will actually have a lot more information to give to you. But for Thales, there's not much we can go on. We know two quotes that are attributable to him. We know some of the things that are claimed to be what happened in his life. And we know some of the things that is suggested as to what Thales believed, i.e., uh, sorry, i.e., sorry, the the fact that water um, was fundamental uh, to all life and all things on Earth, and that Earth rested on water. So that's effectively all we know. In the next lesson, we'll start to look at other uh, people, other philosophers within this basic, very early um, uh, Malthus tradition, uh, and then we will start to move on and look at some more of the pre-Socratic philosophers as we go on. In this lesson, we're going to move on and talk about the next of our ancient philosophers, or at least our pre-Socratic philosophers, and this means looking at the philosophy of Aximander. So, in the last lesson, what we did was we looked at the first of our ancient philosophers, this obviously being um, the philosopher Thales. We explored some of the philosophical thought that was developed by Thales. We know that, of course, there is very little uh, surviving 
actual primary sources on Thales, actual primary works that he had written himself. We know that there are just two quotes, um, the second of which being probably the most important that at least underlines uh, what we believe Thales believed when it came to um, different aspects of metaphysics and cosmology, um, that being that water was the, the, the first source of everything. Um, and we also examined other aspects of his life, because don't forget, at this sort of period in ancient philosophy, in ancient history in general, uh, the idea of there being a philosopher in the sort of traditional way that we understand it today um, it was very unusual. Philosophers tend to be people who were also scientists and were also inventors. And that's why we sort of see um, these very early pre-Socratic philosophers also um, be credited with a number of other achievements. And, and Aximander is no difference in this respect. So Aximander was Thales' junior, okay, and this is somebody who has a much more um, substantive philosophy, okay. We have a lot more um, to actually examine when we look at the philosophy of Aximander compared to that of Thales. And so um, the reason why we know more about the beliefs and the philosophical thoughts of Aximander is because he actually left behind a lot more primary material that we can examine he he left behind his own work a book titled on nature and so we can actually be able to understand his philosophy in a lot more detail than we do um, just taking a couple of very small quotes from Thales and then having to uh, understand and exhibit all of our understanding of Thales through the lens of Plato and Aristotle this book gives us great insight into the philosophical and cosmological beliefs of the early pre-Socratic philosopher. This is not to suggest that um, people like Aristotle are not still probably the most useful sources when it comes to looking at these pre-Socratic philosophers. That's still the case, uh, because even though we have a little bit more surviving works um, by Aximandia than we did of Thales, for the most part, we can understand a lot of these early pre-Socratic philosophers through the lens of people like Aristotle, because of course Aristotle was the almost the first um, philosophical historian in that regard. So, just like with Thales, as I've already mentioned, Aximander is credited with a number of different achievements that we wouldn't traditionally describe as philosophy um, to this day. The general understanding of a philosopher um, these days, we tend to think of people like Descartes, uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, although Bertrand Russell is credited with a number of other achievements in mathematics. Um, and so is Descartes, in fact. Uh, we, we tend not to think of them as um, people like physicists or people who um, uh, contribute quite a lot to um, inventions and other things like that. And we know that Aximander is, is, is one of these people. He is credited as being um, the first person to create a map of the world, albeit a not particularly accurate map of the world, um, but still a map of the world nonetheless, as well as being the first person in Greece to create a sundial. So we know that these are um, two works that are quite uh, inventive of Aximander and contribute to uh, his philosophy as well, in the sense that we have um, other inventions of his and other, um, uh, other achievements that he had. Unlike Thales, though, it's his philosophical work that is seen as more of an important achievement. At least for our purposes, we have a better understanding of his philosophy. So let's think about his philosophy. Let's unpack it in a little bit more detail. And we'll begin by talking about what he believed um, relating to more metaphysical inquiry. So things such as uh, reality and the universe. According to Aximandia, the Earth was not necessarily a sphere, but instead was more cylindrical. And... It should be worth noting at this point that uh, as far back as the ancient Greeks, uh, we knew that the Earth was round. There was a sort of old historical tradition of people believing that we only really knew that the Earth was round as late as what maybe like the Enlightenment period. And before all then, and dating back through the Middle Ages and into the ancient um, history, uh, we always thought that the Earth was flat. This is not the case. We know that the Earth was round uh, and have known that the Earth was round for a very long time. In fact, we have been able, um, as early as ancient Greece, to be able to um, a measure the circumference uh, of the Earth um, by way of using different, um, different shadows and stuff like that. So he believed that the Earth was not necessarily a sphere, but was more cylindrical. He believed that surrounding the Earth were these great rings that were full of fire. And 
the reason why we have stars and the sun and the moon is not because these are celestial bodies that inhabit the sky, but instead because they were holes in these great rings of fire, uh, and these holes allowed us to see the fire that were within um, these rings. And so therefore, they're like um, poking holes into um, the sky almost. He believed that the earth itself stays in place, not because it rests on water, like Thales believed, but instead because it rests equidistant from everything else in the universe, and suggesting that if everything was equidistant, there was no reason for there to be any kind of movement out of their position. Now, of course, we know that the earth does move, and it does move quite quickly, <laughs> and so does the sun, and so does the, the galaxy that we're in. Uh, but we know that um, according to Aximandia, uh, because everything was equidistant from each other, it means that there was no reason for anything to move. So he sort of removed from his philosophy this sort of idea that Thales had that in order for the Earth to stay where it was, it had to rest on some kind of thing, just like in order for us to know how things um, stay where they are in the real world, we know that they have to rest on some kind of thing as well. For example, we can't just hold a pen in the sky without it obviously fall into the ground it has to rest on something so Thales took that and believed that well if that's the case then the earth has to rest on something and if the earth rests on something it might as well be water because Thales believed that water was the the most fundamental principle of everything Aximandir didn't believe any of that so we have a, a very different cosmology and a very different uh, metaphysics and philosophy of reality when it comes to Aximandir than it did when we had uh, when we were looking at Thales Going into a bit more detail on the cosmology, Aximandia again disagreed with Thales that things can be explained as coming from some universal element. So we know, as we've already mentioned, that the most fundamental principle that Thales believed was that everything was made of water and it was the first and most fundamental cause of everything. Aximandia disagreed with this, not necessarily disagreeing that there had to be some kind of fundamental principle or some fundamental cause, but just disagreeing that this fundamental cause had to be some kind of material element, like water. Instead, he used a Greek word here, um, the, uh, the word itself being apirion, or apiron, uh, and he used this to define the fundamental principle of all things. The rough translation from ancient Greek is to mean the infinite. So instead of understanding the fundamental principle of all things as something that we can um, have any kind of reality, uh, sorry, any kind of relation to, such as water, he believed it was this kind of fundamental, infinite, uh, more ethereal concept. According to Aximandia, the fundamental principle of all things was undefined and ethereal and was something that we could... Um, uh, that's something we could ex uh, not something that we could actually describe and explain and, and touch and interact with, such as water. But what we do know uh, is that the concept of this aperion or aperon uh, is the idea that it was infinite in some way. Now, the word, the translation directly from ancient Greek um, tends to ascribe a little bit more uh, flair to the idea of this uh, aperon. Uh, but in reality, we did know that Aximandia believed that this sort of principle, this fundamental principle of all things, was everlasting. So in in the literal definition, um, it was infinite. But of course, we it's tend to given it tends we tend to give it a little bit more uh, linguistic flair by assuming that this fundamental principle was something like the infinite. But that's just the translation. What about the origins of the Earth and the origins of the cosmos? Well, according to Aximandia, he presents quite a poetic, almost religious understanding of the origins of the Earth and the cosmos. This is not to suggest that we should be able to understand Aximandia's philosophy in any kind of um, theological way. That's not to be the case. But the way he describes these kind of processes is quite poetic in nature. That's why I uh, suggested that it's almost religious as an understanding. He believed that the universe was composed of these opposite forces that acted on each other, almost dialectically. If we um, take uh, a little bit more of a Hegelian understanding of uh, ancient philosophy, we can understand this as sort of a dialectical understanding of, uh, of different forces. So 
uh, in dialectics we understand things that are two opposing forces that are in conflict with each other um, and the examples that are presented here things like light and dark and hot and cold these are things that are opposing forces that seem to act in contrast with each other and Aximandia believed that um, the universe was composed of these um, almost dialectical forces in one of his surviving fragments, we have a direct quote, and this is where I suggest that it's almost poetic and almost religious in nature. He says that these opposing forces, they pay penalty and render reparation to each other for their injustice under the arbitration of time. Very poetic, very, uh, yeah, very uh, wishy-washy almost in the language. But what he believed was that these, um, the first of these opposites were the hot and the cold, and the next were the fire and the earth, which, according to uh, Anthony Kenny, um, lay the origins of the cosmos. So this is what he believed was the origins of the earth. He believed that the origins of the earth came about because of this sort of dialectical relationship between these opposing forces. The first of these being the hot and the cold, the second being the fire and the earth, and that these two came together and because of their um, uh, because of their opposing um, forces, they came into existence at the same time in that kind of way. So these were the beliefs, uh, the philosophical beliefs, the cosmological beliefs, and also um, the beliefs about the origins of, of the cosmos and the origins of reality uh, that we have for the ancient philosopher Aximandia. Uh, next lesson is going to focus on a, on a different school of thought and a much more familial um, philosopher from the pre-Socratic era, and that is the philosopher of Pythagoras. Of course, we know Pythagoras also from his work in mathematics. So we will talk about him in the next lesson. In this lesson, we're going to continue talking about the pre-Socratic philosophers. We've spoken about Thales, we've spoken about Anaximandia, we've also spoken about Pythagoras, and in this lesson we're going to talk about uh, Xenophanes, someone who we know a little bit more about in terms of their philosophy, but still not that much uh, compared to as we carry on and we look at people like Heraclitus, for example, and then we get into actually looking at Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. So now that we've looked at some of the earliest Greek pre-Socratic philosophers, we're going to move on and examine a period that is marked with a much wider understanding of the philosophy than the previous era. So we sort of divide the eras up a little bit. And we sort of argue that Xenophanes begins a, a, a new era of, um, of ancient Greek philosophy. But for the most part, uh, most people will just lump all of these uh, people in together as the pre-Socratics. And that's what we're going to do. This period, we have a much greater wealth of primary resources to understand the thinker's beliefs. So uh, even though there isn't uh, that much on um, Xenophanes that we have in terms of primary sources, we still have a lot more than we do of, for example, people like Thales. And when we carry on and we start to look at people like Heraclitus, uh, uh, like Parmenides, uh, for example, we're going to see that they have a lot more sources and wealth of information about them um, than the people like Thales, for example, which is a um, very sparse amount of information. So let's take an introduction to Xenophanes. Xenophanes of Colophon was born around the year 560 BC and died around the year 478 which is, for ancient Greece, an incredibly long life, <laughs> as you can probably see here. Um, we don't know exactly the years that they, uh, that they were born and died, but um, generally speaking, we know that they, were, they lived a very long life, and they lived around 560 to 478. And it is said that Xenophanes himself was actually expelled from Colophon, when he was young and he actually spent the rest of his life as a kind of wanderer producing his own thoughts and developing his own philosophy now he was expelled from colophon um, for uh, arguably uh, or allegedly um, being involved in a revolutionary action and we see here that um, the the mysticism around uh, xenophanes is almost a little bit like the mysticism around pythagoras that we looked at in the last lesson where they uh, began to uh, live a life as a sort of quote-unquote wanderer, producing um, lots of different philosophies and different um, poetics and different, um, different ideas. And just like with all of the pre-Socratic philosophers we have explored thus far, 
there is a heavy emphasis with Xenophanes on the idea of cosmology and the nature of the universe. And just like with the pre-Socratic philosophers we looked at as well, um, there was a an emphasis on the idea of fundamental principles of all things. Just like Thales believed that water was the fundamental principle of all things are in reality, according to Xenophanes, he developed his own account of cosmology and reality, believing that the fundamental principle of all things was Earth. Now, you might be starting to wonder, those of you who have um, ever uh, watched uh, The Last Day of Bender, probably begin to get an idea of the kind of um, where the idea of the, uh, of the fundamental elements in that show uh, has come from. Because in that show, we have uh, water, air, earth, and fire. And you will start to develop, and we will start to see as we go through the different philosophers, we go through Thales, we go through uh, Anaximander, uh, we go through Xenophanes, we start to see that, um, <laughs> that water, earth, uh, air, and fire are the fundamental principles um, that these philosophers believe in as well. So quite a nice little link there if anybody is interested in there uh, or at least want to go back to their childhood and look at some old cartoons. Um, that's where these things come from. So Xenophanes himself believed that the earth was actually infinite. And so if you were to dig down, and you will never reach the bottom. It was a complete um, infinite um, earth that uh, you know wasn't like any kind of globe that existed. Uh, and this does raise a bit of a problem. Okay, and we see the um, we see the fragment here where he believes this. He says that all things from earth and in earth all things end. Now you might be looking at this and you might be thinking there's a little bit of a, um, a biblical reference almost in this in this fragment. You can almost make the link from this fragment to the idea of um, uh, of of the the idea of. Uh, the biblical idea um, that of ashes to ashes and, and dust to dust and things coming back to the earth. And of course, um, you might find that there are little biblical links um, that are that are that are found with ancient Greek philosophy. Of course, ancient Greek philosophy came uh, much earlier than than both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and so we can see that there might be little small influences as we go along. And you might want to um, make these little references uh, as we see them. Now, it is clear, at least from this passage, that Xenophanes believed the earth to be a fundamental element, just as Thales believed uh, water was the fundamental things of all life and all of nature. And so Xenophanes believed that all things from earth and in earth all things end. Now, since Xenophanes believed the earth was infinite and it, you could dig down and you would never reach the bottom, he did not believe, therefore, that the sun passed under the earth, since there was nothing for the sun to pass under. There was just an infinite earth. So what did he believe about the existence of the sun? How did he believe the sun came up and then eventually set? Well, instead of coming to the belief that the sun was uh, something that passed under the earth uh, and rotated around the earth, or uh, as we now know, the earth rotated around the sun, Xenophanes believed that the sun was not a single entity and that existed in the sky. Rather, he believed that the sun that we see every single day was actually new every single day. The sun was made from sparks in the sky and came into existence in the morning and then dispersed off into infinity when the night came around. Now, you might think that this is quite a silly understanding of how uh, the sun uh, operates today. Obviously, you've got, you know, uh, more than 2,000 years of experience on Xenophanes. But in reality... If you believed that the earth was infinite and you believed that there was no getting the, the, the earth, you could just dig down forever and you would never reach the bottom, which Xenophanes certainly did believe, then the idea that we see a new sun every single day is not something that was um, particularly um, outlandish of a thought, especially when we have some quite outlandish thoughts um, in ancient philosophy already. And so what we see here is actually quite interesting that um, he likens Xenophanes um, the idea of there being multiple suns with the idea of there being multiple days. He believed that just as there are multiple days, as days um, carry on and we have uh, lots of them throughout the years, okay, so too are there multiple suns. Now, this is actually quite interesting because there is a link that, to be made here. There is a link that Xenophanes makes between the sun and the days, but it's just not how we would describe this link in, in modern science today. 
Now we know that um, the rotation of the Earth um, is what defines a day in modern science to, uh, today. And uh, Xenophanes makes this link, but he doesn't make the link in the same kind of way. He believes that the sun is actually new and it is the earth that is infinite. So rather than it being the sun that is a more fundamental print, uh, a more fundamental thing um, that exists, it's actually the earth that's more fundamental, according to Xenophanes. So we can see a little bit of a, uh, of a link between um, days and the sun, but in no way would we suggest that this is any kind of um, legitimate scientific discovery. There's also a nice link with religion that we see with Xenophanes. So he is known for being a little bit of a demystifying philosopher. When it, he came to make statements about the explanation of reality in nature, he did not rely on overly theological interpretations. Now, the idea of there being quite a lot of theological interpretations was something that we did see a little bit of with the other philosophers that we will come on to as well. Um, rather than a theological interpretation of rainbows, for instance, um, as some kind of divinity, as was believed by lots of different people and lots of different thinkers and philosophers in ancient Greece, Xenophanes took a more mechanistic interpretation, and he argued that they were simply multicolored clouds. So he takes the theology out of all of these different ideas. Now, this is not to suggest that he was not theological at all, and he simply sought to devoid the theological from the natural. He argued that God did not tell us mortals all when time began. So we see a little bit of a difference here. That the He was not necessarily um, anti-theological or anti-religious. He didn't su suggest that the theological is not to be um, regarded. Rather, he sort of devoided and delineated between the theological and the natural. And he continues... Um, that uh, God did not tell us all when time began. Only through long time search does knowledge come to man. Now, that's a nice little uh, poetic there. And so he, he, he makes it very important to note that there is a difference between um, what is theologically determined and what is naturally determined. Before we finish, I want to just talk a little bit about some of the early scientific discoveries that uh, Xenophanes is credited with. Um, just like with people like Thales and Aximander and Pythagoras, we have some early scientific discoveries that are, are that are linked to their philosophy. So the most interesting is the observation of the fossil record. He believed that the Earth was once in a state covered entirely by the sea, which is not necessarily um, uh, false in any particular way. And he uses this basic understanding of fossils to support this argument. He suggested where we see a discovery of seashells found that are inland from, um, from, uh, from the sea, that this is evidence that the land was once underwater. And so that's where we start to see his uh, understanding of the idea that the earth was entirely covered by sea come from. But... In doing so, in, in using the fossil, in using his understanding of fossils, and using his discovery of fossils as a, a as a backbone to this um, earthly philosophy, he actually stumbles upon an observation that is much more scientifically prudent, which is a discovery of the fossil record, which is quite interesting um, for Xenophanes to uh, examine. Now, in the next lesson, we're going to talk about Heraclitus. Heraclitus being a much more well, uh, much uh, better understood philosopher than all of the philosophers we've previously looked at. What I want to do in this lesson is continue our study of the pre-Socratic philosophers and pre-Socratic philosophy more generally, and focus on a much more prominent figure within the history of philosophy and with ancient philosophy, that being um, Heraclitus. Now. Heraclitus is one of the most significant philosophers we've thus far studied. If you notice from the previous lesson, people like Thales and Aximander, we've been talking about um, very little because there is actually very little that we attribute to them um, uh, because of how old this, uh, this area of philosophy is and how little remains in terms of writing, in terms of philosophy itself. But Heraclitus um, is one where we have quite a lot of primary material and he's was a philosopher who was possibly the most influential if we examine the history of Western philosophy, uh, at least when it comes to pre-Socratic philosophers. Now, I'm sure a lot of people would argue that people like Plato and Aristotle have a much greater impact on the um, Western philosophy, on the history of Western philosophy than Heraclitus, but Heraclitus definitely does have a lot of influence that we can talk about.
In this lesson, we're going to um, unpack the life of Heraclitus. We're going to unpack his philosophy, and we're going to talk about some of the most uh, influential beliefs that we have uh, relating to Heraclitus, namely looking at things related to the metaphysics, uh, metaphysics of flux, and his legacy is left on the study of um, philosophy. His introduction of political philosophy as well is quite interesting, uh, in addition to um, the pre-Socratic um, era. So, as an introduction, we know that Heraclitus was born around the year 535 BC and he died around the year 475 BC, uh, around the age of about 60. He lived in Ephesus, uh, where he did a lot of his philosophical writings. And a lot of these philosophical writings have actually survived to this day, which is obviously one of the reasons why we know so much about the philosophy of Heraclitus, because we have a lot of his surviving works. While um, uh, he did a great amount, we do have a great amount of his primary writings, this does no, in no way mean that we have a detailed and comprehensive understanding of his beliefs. So we do have a lot of his primary writings, as I've just mentioned, but a detailed and comprehensive understanding of his beliefs, uh, or a detailed and comprehensive understanding of any of the beliefs of the pre-Socratic philosophers is something that we don't really have uh, much of. This is because uh, while we have a great amount of fragments, um, the way he writes is akin to ambiguous phrases and semi-poetic prose. So we have a lot of content by uh, Heraclitus, but the actual content itself is quite ambiguous and is very semi-poetic in nature, which makes it very difficult to really pin down the things that he believes and the things that he doesn't believe, the things that um, he is saying poetically, the things that he is acting out as actual um, philosophy. Uh, some suggest that his writing style was supposed to replicate the Oracle of Apollo, um, who was said to, quote, neither speak nor conceal but gesture. So uh, the aim, maybe, by Heraclitus was to um, represent and to um, replicate um, particular oracles within um, Greek mythology. This writing style is often, um, reason, often the reason why he is described as Heraclitus the Obscure, because, again... Because of the way he writes, um, it is very difficult to understand what he believes uh, in, in any great detail. Despite this, though, he was influential in both antiquity and beyond the broader study of philosophy. So despite the fact that not only um, do we have quite a lot of his writings, and um, uh, most of his writings are very ambiguous uh, and very difficult to understand uh, and very difficult to derive any kind of meaning from, um, we do have certain bits that we can probably know for sure um, we come from Heraclitus and our actual beliefs of Heraclitus. So, for example, a very famous thinker um, who is known to be influenced very heavily by Heraclitus uh, was, is the philosopher um, Hegel. And we know um, from, uh, you should know at least if you're somebody who studied continental philosophy, for example, um, Hegel was a, an influential philosopher, influenced uh, a number of different things uh, within um, political philosophy. So he was um, influencing very heavily people like Karl Marx, who would eventually come on to write his own philosophies, etc., etc., so one of Hegel's most influential additions to the tradition of philosophy was his idea of dialectics, something that was semi-inspired actually by Heraclitus. Uh, and the idea of dialectics would be picked up again by Marx into something known as dialectical materialism, which is one of the um, ways in which he describes uh, uh, the, uh, the way in which he describes his theory of history within Marx's philosophy. We'll get to this later. Let's just uh, as a little spoiler. So let's begin by thinking about the philosophy of Heraclitus. Heraclitus wanted to write philosophy as if he was the first philosopher to come into existence. He believed that all the works that came before him were useless and incorrect. So he was quite a smug philosopher as well. And despite the fact that uh, he believed this, uh, and he, he made this very um, bold claim that he was the first philosopher and that the people before him were all um, incorrect in their beliefs and mistaken in their beliefs. Despite all this, he was still very heavily influenced by philosophers before him, um, many of which we've already studied. So, for example, when it comes to cosmology, he believed that there was a new sun that came into existence every day, just like Xenophanes that we looked at in the previous lesson. And the most important of his contributions, despite the fact he was influenced quite heavily by previous philosophers claiming that he wasn't, um, the most important uh, uh, contribution to his philosophy 
is his metaphysics of flux. Now, this is something that is very, very interesting. The concept of motion and flux within metaphysics was something that Heraclitus um, developed um, almost in a vacuum. Heraclitus believed that everything was in motion. The most famous belief uh, depiction of this comes from one of his fragments. Uh, and this is the fragment that is uh, paraphrased here, stating that you cannot step into the same river twice. This encapsulates his belief within um, the universe when it comes to the ideas of motion and flux. This essentially um, uh, essentially encapsulates this belief uh, that if things are always in flux and if things are always in motion, then nothing can ever be the same. And so therefore, the idea that you cannot step into the same river twice um, could be taken to mean that you step into one the, the river, um, but that same river does not exist uh, when you step into it again because everything is in motion and everything is always changing and is in flux. The water in a flowing river will be different from the first step uh, that you make to the second step. Therefore, it is not the same river. Now, both Plato and Aristotle would eventually uh, in the future present arguments for clarification of this particular fragment. Um, arguably, one can step into the same river twice so long as one delineates between the concept of the river and the concept of water that flows in the river. So as a challenge that you can present to Heraclitus is that you could step into the same river twice if in, when we define river, we're defining the object that we would um, delineate as the river, and we would delineate that from the concept of the water that flows in the river. So there's a difference that we have here, uh, and that is one challenge that we can present um, to this particular passage. While the flowing stream is a good encapsulation of his beliefs relating to flux, it is the concept of fire that Heraclitus believed was the most pertinent example of motion. So Heraclitus was um, quite uh, uh, quite fixated on the idea of fire as a um, uh, as something that is fundamental to um, the uh, world, a fundamental element. He believed that the world was like a fire, with the sea and the earth coming out of the fire as ashes. The world of fire was uh, where all kinds of different elements were formed. And um, they were all formed from fire. So just like how Thales, for example, believed that everything came from water, Heraclitus believed that everything um, in the universe, or at least everything on Earth, comes from um, the existence of fire. And the thing that governed this world of fire, according to Heraclitus, was a concept known as Logos. The idea of Logos is one that has had different interpretations as the years have gone on um, throughout the traditions of um, philosophy. And the word will ultimately enter into Christian th uh, theology in when we start to see um, the development of Christian theology in the uh, turn of the millennia. And traditionally, Logos uh, was just the, uh, just the traditional terms for the written word. However, it was with Heraclitus that the word would actually change and take on a new meaning uh, when it comes to um, what it actually represents within the broader philosophy. So, for example, in modern translations of the word, um, it is often uh, is given a lot more of a grand meaning to it, suggesting it to mean something like reason uh, or, or, or being linked quite closely to the idea of logic. You might think um, so there might be a, a similarity in terms of the way in which um, the, the word sounds, at least, uh, you know, um, phonically, it is um, very similar to the concept of um, logic. Now, according to Heraclitus, the Logos was a universal, and um, for most it was unattainable. Um, the, con uh, the, the idea of Logos was something that, that people could not ever ascribe to getting to. Now, moving on a little bit from the metaphysics, let's talk a little bit about the idea of dialectics, um, which is obviously what uh, was developed under Hegel, um, but the idea of the conscience of opposites was something that was developed by Heraclitus that obviously influenced Hegel um, quite heavily. Heraclitus believed in a number of concepts in reality that were two sides of a contradictory dichotomy. For example, he believed that the universe was both divisible and indivisible, that the universe was also mortal and immortal at the same time. And the best way to explain this is his belief that the way up and the way down are the same. So when we're talking about, for example, climbing a mountain, 
um, taken literally, this is true. The way up the mountain and the way down the mountain are the same path. It just depends on our interpretation of it. If you climb a mountain, you will pass someone who has already climbed the mountain and is on their way down the mountain. So the idea of these things are fundamentally opposite. The idea that we have this sort of dialectic uh, within the uh, within uh, this particular example of climbing a mountain. We have the way up the mountain and the way down the mountain being the exact same thing. At that point, both the journey up and the journey down are one and the same. Before we finish, I just want to very quickly touch on the influence that Heraclitus had on political philosophy. And the political philosophy of Heraclitus is quite interesting because it is disputed whether or not we could argue that he was the first philosopher to produce a political philosophy. We could argue, You could make the claim that he was the first political philosopher um, because we can interpret some of the fragments of Heraclitus in different ways. As I've noticed at the start of this lesson, um, because he's very poetic and very ambiguous, we can, um, uh, we can interpret some of the fragments to be political in nature. So it does seem that he talks about this idea of there being a, quote, divine law. And the divine law, most um, historians or classicists would agree, is one that is prescriptive and not supposed to be um, interpreted as some kind of uh, physical law. So rather than like a, a law of physics, like, you know, like laws of gravity, for example, um, this idea of the divine law, according to Heraclitus, appears to be something that is prescriptive in nature. It seems to be something that is directing individuals as to what ought to be done. It should. It's more normative as a claim. So, put simply, this idea of divine law is one that can be we can describe as a law that we understand colloquially. The idea that we understand laws colloquially as just rules, rules that we understand. And some of the fragments um, speak of this idea of the law and the idea that people must fight on behalf of the law as they would fight for the city wall. So Heraclitus's beliefs um, do seem to um, indicate that there is a little bit of a uh, of a political bent in some of his writings, or at least some of the uh, some of the fragments that we have found. So. This idea of a divine law does hint at the idea that Heraclitus could have been um, one of the earliest or maybe even the earliest of the political philosophers. Hello everybody and welcome back to Ancient Philosophy. In this lesson we're going to be talking about another one of the pre-Socratic philosophers who's contributed some significance to uh, the tradition of philosophy as it has developed. And we're going to talk about Parmenides. And it's quite fitting that we talk about Parmenides as almost a contrast to the philosopher from the previous lesson who was Heraclitus. Because they did actually have some quite fundamentally contradictory beliefs when it came to uh, the nature of metaphysics, for example. So that's what we're going to do in this lesson. We're going to unpack Parmenides as a philosopher and we're going to talk about some of the uh, most important contributions Parmenides has made to both philosophy and science. So, um, like I've mentioned already, in the last lesson we looked at the philosophy of Heraclitus and we're going to explore the philosophy of Parmenides. And as I mentioned again, uh, Parmenides represents a stark contrast to that of the philosophy that was presented by Heraclitus. So, according to Aristotle, Parmenides was either a student of Xenophanes, somebody who we've talked about already, um, either directly a student or at least a student of the teachings of Xenophanes. So, there is a link in terms of the philosophical inquiry between these two different thinkers. He spent uh, the majority of his life near a city, uh, near the city of Naples, and this place was called Elia, and uh, this is where he introduced a number of interesting philosophical inquiries during this time. And actually, he would be known for uh, for founding a a little bit of a a little bit of a philosophical movement in this e region. And we'll actually get on to the next lesson when we talk about uh, Zeno, um, who is somebody who uh, almost carried on the tradition of um, uh, Parmenides's work. The vast majority of what we know about Parmenides um, in terms of the primary sources and primary information and the, and the fragments we understand to um, have about Parmenides or directly saw, written by Parmenides comes from a poem which contains a number of philosophical thoughts and beliefs. And 
of this poem that we have, there is around 120 lines that still survive. And from these 120 lines, we can deduce a number of things related to his beliefs. But again, just like with other ancient philosophers during this time period, during this sort of pre-Socratic era, we don't know um, how much of what Parmenides believed was actually what he believed in fact or what he was doing um, in terms of just writing poetically about a particular issue because uh, these philosophers wrote in um, quite um, ambiguous prose and quite poetic um, uh, using quite a poetic language uh, we know that there is a little bit of a distinction that can be made in terms of what we know for sure he believed and what he was writing about that can be taken to be quite more uh, a lot more ambiguous but the poem itself, that is, uh, the 120 lines that survive, is split into two parts. The first is the, quote, path of truth, and the second is the path of mortal opinion. So um, we have here quite um, two um, uh, relatively um, symbolic um, titles for, uh, for, for the poems that he had written. And in terms of what we can take out and extract from these poems and look at to have an understanding of what he actually believed Parmenides, uh, one of the things that's the most important is the contribution to metaphysics, namely the almost the introduction to the study of ontology, which is a very major aspect of uh, metaphysics itself. Within this, um, as I will describe, very poorly written poem, um, definitely a very poorly written poem. I remember having to read it myself um, when I was studying ancient philosophy as an undergrad, and it was not particularly very fun to, uh, to go through. Um, so that set homework wasn't particularly great for me. Um, within this poem, we find Parmenides beginning a new philosophical tradition. And this is the philosophical tradition that we know today to be ontology. Parmenides is credited, sorry, uh, credited with the creation of the study of ontology. And we know, or we should know, uh, for those who have taken a few basic philosophy classes or maybe um, gone through our lessons on metaphysics already, that ontology is the study and the philosoph philosophical study of being and becoming, the concept of what it means for something to exist in a particular way. The idea of being is heavily um, linked with um, the contrasting ideas that Parmenides has about flux. If you remember at the start of this lesson, I mentioned that um, Parmenides exists as almost a stark contrast in terms of uh, philosophical beliefs to that of Heraclitus. And we know from the last lesson that Heraclitus was somebody who believed that the universe was in a constant state of flux. And we cited the very, very famous fragment or the famous passage that uh, one does never uh, step into the same river twice. The idea of this being um, that we are poetically representing um, the way in which you you cannot step into the same river and for it to be the same because the river is constantly flowing and it's constantly in flux. Unlike Heraclitus, Parmenides was not a believer that everything in the universe was in some kind of motion. Um, in contrast, in fact, he was a philosopher who championed the idea that things were not in motion. He um, starkly disagreed with the beliefs of Heraclitus. And so how do these beliefs relating to whether or not um, things are in motion or things are not in motion, the idea of flux versus not being in flux, how do these things relate to Parmenides' beliefs in the um, concept of ontology and the nature of being? Well, according to, every, uh, according to Parmenides, sorry, everything in the universe is what he describes as a being. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, the idea of being is a single unified concept. It is an idea that something is indivisible, having no experience of temporal change. If you are something that is uh, a concept that is being, then you are not something that can be divided. You're not something that can experience temporal passage. Contrast this with, as I've mentioned, the ideas that were presented by Heraclitus, the idea that things can experience temporal passage, things that can be divisible. Everything is in motion. Water will boil uh, and the water um, is when the water is leaving and um, the steam is being born almost. So we have an instance here where um, whatever happens, there is always something that is um, coming into and out of existence as a kind of constant, uh, a constant notion of flux within the universe. Well, according to Parmenides, everything that changes in the universe will not e change externally to this idea of being. 
So something might uh, change. I don't think Parmenides would disagree that things in the universe will change or things in the world around him will change. You can see that um, using your, um, you know, your, your visible experiences, your visible perception. But what Parmenides believed that anything that does change will change, but not because of a change in the nature of being. It will change externally to this uh, ontological concept of being. Ultimately, this means that um, being is never changing. Even if things appear to have changed, they are in fact being and they are the same. So again, quite a complicated um, and quite difficult to explain in language the concept of being within uh, Parmenides' philosophy. And because obviously we have, a, we use the word being um, in lots of different ways in, in, in modern terminology, in the modern lexicon of, of the English language. And so the concept of being as described by Parmenides is a little bit different to uh, what we would describe as being um, if we were to describe that word colloquially. So a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a difficult thing to uh, deal with in that particular regard. When it comes to his scientific discoveries, just like with all the philosophers before, we hang, we can credit a number of different philosoph uh, philosophical, uh, not philosophical, scientific uh, discoveries to uh, Parmenides. For Parmenides, his scientific discoveries are linked creatively. Um, with philosophical and mathematical notions of identity, which is quite interesting, okay? Because what he does is he is he, he makes um, scientific discoveries, but what's most most important about these scientific discoveries isn't the fact that they are scientific discoveries, but the implication that these scientific discoveries will have on metaphysics and on mathematics in the future. So, for example, he was the, um, as a general side example, he was the first person in history, um, at least on paper, at least notably in history, to conclude that the Earth was a sphere. So we've known the Earth was a sphere, a sphere uh, at least as early as Parmenides. So that sort of dispels the common myth that people thought the Earth was uh, uh, was flat all the way up to uh, up to the Enlightenment, for example. This isn't true. We've we've known the Earth was round for a very long period of time. At least most people do. There are still some conspiracy theories today. So previously, thinkers and philosophers had all kinds of shapes in mind about what the Earth was said to be. For example, we had the ideas um, from previous philosophers that the Earth was um, cylindrical in nature, or that the Earth was infinite. That the, it would always go down to the, it would go down to um, infinity. You could never dig to the bottom of the Earth, and so therefore the sun had to be um, new and come into existence every single day to try and explain this cycle. A second discovery. Um, which is a lot more closely linked with these ideas relating to metaphysics, uh, mathematics, and notions of identity, is that he concluded or deduced that the morning star and the evening star were both the same star, which is very, very interesting. You might not think that that is something that is quite, um, you know, who really cares from a philosophical position, but it is interesting because a great amount of metaphysics uh, relates to the concept of identity. It would start this new philosophical inquiry into the metaphysics of identity, the difference between numerical identity and the difference between quantitative identity and qualitative identity, all of these different things. And identity in logic as well is actually quite interesting when we think about how identity operates within, for example, um, uh, uh, first order logic or predicate logic, as we can sometimes describe it. These are things that if you are somebody who's doing a philosophy degree or is going through the lessons on this channel, um, looking at uh, different um, philosophical um, theories, you, you will notice and you will come to note that um, the metaphysics of identity is quite important. And it's almost as if Parmenides um, kickstarted this belief or this, uh, this sort of inquiry through his belief in a basic scientific discovery. So that's quite interesting. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about the philosopher Zeno. And Zeno has a lot more, uh, is one of those philosophers that seems to have breached into um, the sort of common parlance in terms of um, the things that he presented in terms of his philosophy. I'm pretty sure most people who have never done philosophy or studied philosophy before would have a general idea about some of the um, thought experiments that Zeno had uh, presented. And we will talk about each of those thought experiments in the next lesson.
In this lesson, we're going to talk about the philosopher Zeno. And uh, for those who are interested, Zeno is actually my favourite of the ancient philosophers, um, just because uh, his beliefs uh, aren't necessarily related to things to do with uh, elements about what the universe is made of, like Thales and Examander and, and Heraclitus or whatever. His his uh, main philosophical contributions, uh, at least contributions to the broader epistemic um, uh, tradition that we understand to be philosophy, um, talks about different paradoxes uh, and how apparently things can't ever move, which is very, very uh, uh, interesting indeed. And that's what we're going to do in this lesson. So he's very um, influential and very interesting. Um, for those who have never studied philosophy before, you've probably had um, some experience understanding some of these um, different um, uh, different paradoxes in your life. That's how influential they are. And Zeno of Elia himself was a follower of Parmenides, and we will understand why this is quite interesting as we go on. Because if you remember from the last lesson, Parmenides was a philosopher who disagreed very, very heavily with Heraclitus. If you remember, Heraclitus was the ancient philosopher who believed that everything in the universe was in motion, uh, was in flux, is the word that was uh, is, is often um, described. And according to Parmenides, uh, this is incorrect. This is not the case. And Zeno was a follower of Parmenides, and so his paradoxes uh, are sort of established to try and support this proposition. And it's quite interesting um, how well he does as a result. Today, Zeno is best known for his paradoxes of motion, paradoxes that provide insightful challenges to the nature of mathematics of infinity uh, uh, and to the nature of motion. And we we will you'll probably think that some of these paradoxes are um uh, quite um farcical uh, or, or quite laughable in terms of uh, how they operate in the real world but some of these paradoxes didn't really have any kind of um uh, proper presentable mathematical challenges until relatively recently until like relatively modern in the last few hundred years um, so these these were influential paradoxes so let's think about the paradoxes of motion that we can talk about. We're going to unpack each of these paradoxes in turn, and we're going to talk about the three most important ones, or the three most popular paradoxes that Zeno um, outlines. So we'll look at the dichotomy paradox first, um, followed by the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise, and then finally the paradox of the moving arrow. And we'll talk about what each of them mean, what each of them do, and then the implications that Zeno has when it comes to things relating to infinity because in, uh, Zeno's understanding of infinity is quite interesting compared to um, I, I mean uh, and it contributes a little bit to our understanding of infinity to this day so let's begin with a dichotomy paradox each of these paradoxes by the way are presented by Aristotle in physics uh, and the dichotomy paradox is presented as follows they say that that which is in locomotion must arrive at the halfway stage before it arrives at the goal so what does this mean why is this a paradox well what this means is if I was to travel from point A to point B uh, and this, um, these two points were separated by some kind of um, space, so whatever it be, a mile or a meter or whatever. And if I was to travel along this journey at a set period of uh, set speed, okay, at one point, at some point within this journey, I'm going to reach the halfway stage of point A and point B, and then from there. I'm going to reach the halfway stage from this origin, this first halfway stage to point B. And then from there, I'm going to reach the halfway point from this previous halfway point to point B, etc., 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 all the way ad infinitum. So let's say I travel one mile in a direction. According to this paradox, it, one can divide this journey up ad infinitum. We can divide it up infinitely to the point that no matter how far I travel, there will always be a certain amount of journey left to go. I can always half the journey that I have um, left to go. So I could always go from um, point A to point B and then go halfway and then go halfway from there and then halfway from there, halfway from there, halfway from there, all the way to the point where can I ever reach the end? And so how does this um, relate to motion? Well, Effectively, what it suggests is a person um, who is traveling from one point to another can never reach this journey, can never reach this, this end, this end point. 
I can never reach them one mile mark since I can always divide the journey uh, I've got into smaller pieces and then whatever I've got left of those smaller pieces I can divide that in half again and etc 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 that is the first of Zeno's paradoxes now you'll notice that the, the next two paradoxes are, are somewhat similarly related to um, Zeno's um, first paradox the dichotomy paradox because Essentially, what Zeno is doing is showing that motion does not exist, and he's doing so using um, using the concepts of infinity. So um, there's only a few different ways in which you can uh, describe it uh, and describe how motion does not exist. And the second of these paradoxes is the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. Again, we take this from Aristotle. They say that in a race, the quickest runner can never overtake the slowest since the pursuer must first reach the point whence the pursued started so that the slower must always hold the lead okay now again if you're somebody who has ever watched a race where the uh, a slower person is in front and the quicker person overtakes them you will instantly um, note that this paradox can be blown out of the water straight away but let's just think about what this actually means in terms of what Zeno uh, suggested it to mean so suppose we have two runners, okay? There's one runner that is fast, and there's another runner that is slow. And suppose that we give the slow runner a head start, okay? Such that the fast runner um, starts when the slow runner has made it to 40 meters. So when the slow runner makes it to 40 meters, that's when the faster runner will um, set off. For the faster runner to overtake the slower runner, they must first reach the points that the slower runner had already reached. So in order for, in any way, if we were to ever imagine that the faster runner was ever going to overtake the slower runner, it would have to, they would have to reach 40 meters. But at that point, by the time the fast runner has reached 40 meters, even though he's faster than the slower runner, the slower runner will have gone, let's say, 45 meters or 50 meters. He would be in front. And so by the time the fast runner reached 50 meters, reached this point, the slower runner will again be in front of the faster runner. But he will be in front of the faster runner and there would be a shorter amount of distance in between the two. There will always be a distance between the two, but it will be a shorter amount of distance. And what, uh, and what Zeno is suggesting in this regard is no matter how fast the runner is, if he's given a head start, he will always, he will always have to reach a point that the slow runner has already um, gone to. This point will be um, closer and closer to the um, slower runner, to the point where maybe if, uh, by the time they both, uh, by the time the fast runner reaches 60 meters, the slow runner might only be 61 meters ahead, as in as in 61 meters, as in one meter ahead at that point. And then maybe they might be 500 centimeters, and then 200 centimeters, and then 10 centimeters, and then a millimeter. Again, we can divide this up ad infinitum to the point where you can never have the faster runner overtaking the slower runner. Again, this is another paradox relating to the concept of motion. By the time um, they have reached the 40 meter mark, the slower runner will have moved further ahead. and Therefore, the fast runner can never overtake the slow runner. They can get very, very close to the uh, slow runner. They can get infinitely close to the slow runner. But according to Zeno, they can never overtake the slow runner. And you might be thinking, if you're somebody who is, um, have ever, has ever studied mathematics and has ever studied calculus, you might be thinking that there is a, a little bit of a link in terms of these beliefs to um, the concept of limits within calculus. The point where, uh, a point where we can take a particular um, take a particular limit as a variable or as a variable such as x approaches infinitely to another point but never ever quite reaches it never quite touches that particular point and this is how we derive things like derivatives and, and do differentiation in calculus um, a little bit of a similarity there but of course this was not um, this is not me suggesting that Zeno uh, invented calculus that was uh, Newton and Leibniz as we all know so the final paradox we can talk about is the paradox of the arrow. You can probably understand why I, I enjoy talking about Zeno, because Zeno's paradoxes are very interesting, and they're very fun to explain as well. So I hope I've done a good job. So this is a little bit of a bigger piece of text here, but um, we can uh, unpack it if you want from here. So we say here um, that if everything, when it occupies an equal space, is at rest at the instant of time, and if that... Um, 
which is in locomotion is always occupying such a space at any moment. The flying arrow is therefore motionless at the instant of time or that instant of time and at the next instant of time. But if both instances are taken as the same instance or a continuous instance, then uh, a continuous instance of time, then it is in motion. This paradox is the most closely linked to the concept that motion is just an illusion and motion isn't actually real. So what do we mean by this? OK, let's talk about um, and, and this also is a is a paradox that shows really the influence that Parmenides had on Zeno's philosophy, the concept that motion, uh, that the universe is not in motion. Let's say we have a, a, an archer and he fires an arrow at a at a target. OK, so. To us, what we see is an arrow flying through the air from the archer's bow to the um, point to the to, uh, and let's say it gets a bullseye as well. Let's let's be let's be kind to this uh, archer. Now, during this tip time period, where we can go from point A to point B, we can divide the time that it takes infinitely. And if we take one of these slices of time, uh, we take one of these slices of time, what we see is the arrow is is not in motion because at that one particular instant it is not moving okay it requires for us uh, for us to see that the thing is moving it requires us to have a an understanding of the entire time period from which it leaves the bow to the point where it hits the target so in that regard if we can take these slices of time then at that point in space and in time the arrow is not in motion at all. According to this paradox, if I were to fire an arrow through the air, take one slice of time with that arrow flying through the air, then the arrow would be stationary. If I was to do this, for example, if I was to record a video of it and I was to just um, click each second as it goes on, as it goes past, okay, you will see that at that point it is it is still, it is stationary, and then it moves slightly, then it moves slightly, then it moves slightly. Only when we press play on that video and we see the time going at the normal speed that we see the motion of the arrow. Which is why Zeno believed that, um, uh, we see Zeno believing that um, motion is something that is an illusion and that there is uh, paradoxes that are related to the concept of motion. This is just me explaining it in a little bit more detail. So all of these paradoxes that we have talked about all have one thing in common. And the thing in common that they have is the concept of infinity. Because you might notice that all these um, paradoxes utilize the notion of infinity. Now, infinity is a very interesting um, philosophical and mathematical um, area that someone can study. This is both where Zeno goes wrong in the physical description of these uh, paradoxes, but it's also why these paradoxes are actually quite so interesting. Uh, infinity is a relatively new idea in philosophy during this period. So Zeno utilizes it to derive some quite counterintuitive ideas relating to motion. And they are quite counterintuitive because we can understand what Zeno is saying. If we talk about, for example, the dichotomy paradox, or we talk about the, the movement of the arrow or the Achilles and the tortoise paradox, we can understand what Zeno is saying. And we can even accept that what Zeno is saying might be true. But this is counterintuitive because we know that in reality, okay, Achilles will overtake the tortoise or the uh, person traveling from point A to point B will eventually get to point B, um, so, uh, assuming that nothing uh, inhibits their, uh, you know, their ability to get there. Uh, and for example, the, the, the arrow will eventually um, hit the target and it is uh, in motion. So, so we have this counterintuitive idea where we can accept the understanding, we can set the, accept the basic framework that Zeno presents, but then we can um, understand that in reality, in the real world, um, these paradoxes are false. So a little bit of a food for thought there at the end of this lesson when we're talking about um, Zeno and the concept of utilising infinity as a result of this. Um, we've only got one or two more lessons left on pre-Socratic philosophy before we start to unpack the philosophy of Socrates. And then when we go through Socrates, we'll then go to Plato, of course, uh, spend a lot of time on Plato and then spend a lot of time on Aristotle before we move on and look at um, a couple of philosophers going up into the early Christian period. In this lesson, what we're going to do is talk about the philosophy of the uh, pre-Socratic philosopher Empedocles. Now, we've been going through all the different pre-Socratic philosophers um, for the last few lessons, for the last nine or ten lessons, I believe, so far. We are nearly at Socrates himself, so we've only got a couple more to go.
But the ones that we're going to be talking about now are uh, much more significant in terms of their impacts on philosophy. So while we can say, for example, that Zeno had a certain amount of impact on philosophy, of course people like Heraclitus um, having a somewhat of an impact on um, philosophy, people like Empedocles and um, people like Democri uh, Democritus um, uh, and people like Socrates, of course, will have a much more substantive impact on how we understand philosophy to this day. And so we're going to spend a bit more time on these philosophers. And then, of course, we're going to spend a, a multiple series of lessons on Socrates and Plato and Aristotle uh, before we move into the sort of post-Aristotelian philosophy that we can examine in the ancient world as well. So according to uh, Anthony Kenny, who is a renowned um, historian of philosophy who's written many books on the history of western philosophy um, according to anthony kenny empedocles is the quote most flamboyant of the early philosophers of greek italy now the life of empedocles is very interesting as well because he came from an aristocratic family a lot a lot like some of these other philosophers and he himself spent a lot of time involved in the world of politics. You may remember that some philosophers were less um, inclined to be involved in um, in political debate and in the sort of in the world of politics itself. Empedocles was not one of those individuals. Empedocles was somebody who was very interested in uh, and very keen to involve himself within political life. He was even allegedly. Uh, offered the position of king at one point in his life, but he decided to turn it down, preferring to embark uh, in the world of philosophy and continue to work as a counsellor. So he's a really um, somebody who uh, allegedly turned down the power of king to become a philosopher, uh, which is a very interesting choice if you if I do say so myself. Now, of course, just like with all the ancient philosophers that we can talk about, some of these um, may be um, spurious tales, some of these may be apocryphal tales, not all of them are necessarily uh, bona fide in truth, um, but yeah, allegedly offered to become king at one point in his life. Empedocles was also a physician, famously claiming to have drugs to ward off old age and have the knowledge of mystical spells that would allow him to control the weather. So again, this just does this little quote here ties into the fact and really um, gives us a little bit more of an indication of the kind of things that were considered to be uh, within the remit or within the scope of somebody who was a philosopher. We remember that uh, there was not really much of a distinction between philosophy and science, for example, at the time of um, the ancient world. There would tend to be a, a much more of a, a connection between the sort of words that would be spoken by a philosopher and those that were spoken by somebody who was interested in cosmology. A similar thing can be said about the kind of physician of Empedocles and the mystical knowledge that he said to have had um, that allowed him to allegedly control the weather. And just like other thinkers before him, Empedocles wrote uh, in a number of different uh, ways. One of them was uh, through poetry. The poem uh, famously uh, attributed to Empedocles is titled On Nature. And On Nature and Purifications is the uh, much... Um, uh, are, the, are the two poems, uh, sorry, side by side. And supposedly... This poem was very, very long, containing around 2,000 lines. Unfortunately, though, much of the poem no longer exists. We only have around 20% or a fifth of the fragments from the poem that remain. The second poem that we have uh, mentioned here, um, titled Purifications, was more of a religious poem which, again, only small amounts of the fragments survive to this day, unfortunately. Uh, but Purifications, uh, because it is more of a religious poem, this does touch on one of the things that Empedocles is known for, which is his introduction to, or at least his contributions to, the philosophy of religion, and a little bit more theological implications and interpretations of philosophy as well. Something that is touched on by other philosophers, but you might remember that when we've been talking about people like Thales and Anaximander and, and Zeno and, and, and Heraclitus, we haven't really been mentioning in any great significant detail the impact that religion had on these philosophers. But that's because religion within the fragments that we know didn't really serve much of a purpose. But with Empedocles, there's a lot more of a religious bent to his work. 
On top of his work uh, when it came to the writing of poetry, Empedocles was also a more general prolific writer. According to Aristotle, he wrote uh, a literary epic on the Persian invasion of Greeks. And just like philosophers who came before him, he seemed to have um, followed some of the early traditions of the early Ionian philosophical beliefs. So if you think when we go into all of these um, different philosophical beliefs, just keep in mind all of the philosophers that we have examined previously. And you will come to some kind of idea as to the kind of things that, um, that Empedocles uh, took from other philosophers in the past so he he didn't just uh, come up with his own ideas in themselves just like with every other philosopher um, that existed within this sort of early Ionian um, pre-Socratic era we see that Empedocles has taken from and and added to the conversation to the traditions of the philosophy that we are seeing so as we already know from previous lessons Different pre-Socratic philosophers believed in a whole host of different things relating to uh, what we would describe today as the fundamental elements. So, for example, we knew that Thales believed that water was the fundamental element of everything. According to Heraclitus, it was fire that was the fundamental element of everything. Other philosophers believed that air was the most fundamental element or earth uh, was the most fundamental element. Well, according to Empedocles and uh, a bit of a break from some of the other ideas that we have talked about. Um, Empedocles believed that the four fundamental uh, fundamental elements often that are often cited by the pre-Socratics, so for example, um, water, air, fire, and earth, they all played an important role in the nature of all things, according to Empedocles. So he believed that these were the four fundamental, quote, roots of the universe, not necessarily um, any individual one having any meaningful sense of being fundamental in and of themselves. It should be considered that all of them together are the fundamental roots of the universe. Now, the idea being, according to Empedocles, that these fundamental roots, as they are described, would mix together and create all things that exist in reality to this day. So the idea of these roots of elements that come together to form um, to form the, the works and to form reality to this day um, were translated from Plato into the later word elementum. Now it is from here that we derive the word element in our modern understanding of science. So of course we can draw a direct link between the, the, the word elementum in this particular uh, instance that is translated from Plato or that is uh, attributed to Empedocles to the word element that we use when we are talking about the periodic table or we're talking about chemistry in, in our modern parlance. And so it's quite interesting that the belief in fundamental elements that is adopted by Empedocles um, would be used by philosophers and scientists for the rest of the classical period, going through the sort of medieval period and into the early modern period of history. It wasn't until the 1600s that our attitude towards the concept of reality being built from these fundamental elements would start to shift and change a little bit. And then, of course, with the scientific revolution uh, and and the introduction of things like uh, the work of Mendeleev, for example, when it came to the development of the periodic table. Obviously, at that point, we start to see a departure from um, Empedocles' um, pre-Socratic philosophy. But just as I've said at the start of this lesson, when I mentioned that these philosophers will have such an, an enormous impact on the way in which we understand philosophy, and in fact, we understand science as late as the 1600s, I wasn't. I wasn't exaggerating. And Pericles um, would uh, fundamentally change the way in which we understand reality up to the 1600s. And just like with all of the other uh, pre-Socratic philosophers, as I mentioned, they. Empedocles was also known to have cosmological theories. So he did not just establish a theory of cosmology that justifies the existence of the fundamental elements of the universe, but he also is the first of the pre-Socratic Ionian philosophers to develop a theory as to the causes for the mixing of said elements to create the natural world around us. Again, 
we can talk about the fact that Empedocles adds to the tradition of the Ionian philosophy of the pre-Socratics, adds to this conversation that is being had and that is being developed between all of these early philosophical thinkers. But we should also note that not only is he on the one hand adding to this tradition and adding to this conversation but he is also representing a significant departure from the beliefs that had been previously established first in the idea that the four fundamental elements are not um, any one of them being um, significantly uh, more fundamental than the other uh, than the other three but rather that they are all um, impactful in creating the roots of the universe Similarly, within that regard, in terms of his cosmology, he talks about the idea of the causes of particular uh, things that take place. So, for example, giving uh, an example of this, um, elements um, are caused to come together through love, apparently, according to Empedocles, and that they are caused to break apart as a result of strife. Under this system um, of this kind of dialectical um, uh, distinction between love and strife, objects in the world would be formed out of the fundamental elements, but then they are also said to be broken apart by the same fundamental elements. His system of um, of love and strife also contributes to Empedocles' um, history, uh, sorry, the philosophy of history, which is something that is also new within the pre-Socratic tradition. So, when it comes to the philosophy of history, for Empedocles, history is believed to be a cycle whereby during a certain period we have the two causes that exist. We have love and strife, but over a period of time love might become more dominant as a cause, which causes the fundamental elements to come together to create and to develop in reality. And then during other parts of the um, of the cycle of love and strife, strife is said to be more dominant, causing things to break apart, causing the fundamental elements to 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 distinguish between each other, to break and to um, and, and to uh, and to essentially destroy in that regard. And what this means is that all things in nature, according to Empedocles, are actually temporary, since we can explain history and we can explain historical development through this life cycle, through this um, challenging of dualistic um, ideas between love and strife, coming and going between love and then between strife, between creation and destruction, between coming together as the part of the fundamental elements and the fundamental elements breaking apart. And as I mentioned, finally, at the uh, start of this lesson, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the theological interpretations that had been developed by Empedocles. This is probably the first time, I think, that we are um, talking about the impact of theology on the uh, philosophy of these thinkers. Of course, when we start to talk about um, the impact of Christianity and Judaism and Islam on th- on philosophy, of course, we cannot describe the history of philosophy, especially in the Middle Ages, without talking about the impact of religion. But for the pre-Socratic philosophers, religion wasn't necessarily as important as, it, as their other beliefs. So this is something that, is interesting in the in the in the impact of Empedocles on philosophy. On the one hand, his theological interpretations are very very interesting as they are relatively unique in the tradition of the pre-Socratics. But on the other hand, they're also difficult for us today, for philosophers today, because in terms of trying to interpret what the, uh, uh, what um, Empedocles is saying, we have to try and um, disconnect the theological from the non-theological. And that is very, very difficult to do with the very few fragments that we have. At some point, um, Empedocles' explanations of the universe uh, and the way in which he explains the roots of the fundamental elements is deeply mechanical in nature. It's deeply physical is deeply scientific we would probably um, categorize it if we're if we're going to talk about the sort of taxonomy of these things we could categorize it as being um, something that exists in the realm of physics and cosmology 
But then at other points, similarly, uh, within similar passages of the fragments that we have, Empedocles will make reference to deeply spiritual and deeply religious sentiments instead. And so when we are describing the fundamental elements, he would sometimes talk of them as being deeply mechanical, as de as being the roots of reality and talking about this um, mechanical um, nature of love and strife and the dialectical um, conflict between these two different uh, different causes. He would talk about them in a mechanical way, but he would also sometimes refer to the fundamental elements using the Greek gods. So he would describe the fundamental elements instead of being um, fire, earth, air and water. He would describe them as Zeus, Hera, uh, Idonius and Nestis. So we have a problem with this in this regard because it's difficult in some regard to be able to distinguish between the theological and the non-theological aspects of Empedocles' philosophy. But to, to, that is, to that extent, it is, it is not necessarily too dissimilar to the ways in which theology and religion will impact philosophers for thousands of years as we go into the modern period, where we start to look at the church fathers and we start to look at the Christian doctrine and the impact of the Christian doctrine on philosophy. Of course, we will be very, um, we'll, we'll be stuck when it comes to trying to interpret the theological and the non-theological in that regard. The final thing I want to touch on uh, is not necessarily the philosophy of Empedocles, but is the story of his death. So the story of his death is actually quite interesting in terms of um, how it has um, been able to pass down um, in terms of uh, our colloquial understandings. So for those who have never studied philosophy or ancient philosophy, you might have actually heard of the death of Empedocles because it is um, quite rooted in the culture, of, uh, or, or at least in Western culture. Um, but it's also quite interesting in the sense that it is um, almost heroic uh, as the death of Empedocles is described. According to the legend, it should be noted that this is legend, okay, um, Empedocles had miraculously healed a woman called Panthea. So, uh, again, tying into this uh, mysticism that is surrounding Empedocles, his beliefs in having the ability to cure um, various uncurable ailments and also being able to mystically control the weather, don't forget. Um, he had, he had a a miraculously healed a woman called Panthea. And after a night of celebrations as a result of healing this um, uh, this woman called Panthea, Empedocles heard his name being called from the heavens. He climbed Mount Etna and then decided to jump in the volcano. That is, according to the legend, the death of Empedocles. Now, there's a very famous quote from, I believe it's Paradise Lost, um, that, that references this um, as well. Um, I'll put that quote in the description down below. I thought I had it in this presentation here, but we'll put it in the uh, I'll put it down in the description below. But it is very interesting, um, the death of Empedocles. Now... In another lesson, in the next lesson, we're going to talk about uh, another one of these pre-Socratics. We've only got a couple more to do before we actually get on to the sophists and we start to talk about Socrates, the life of Socrates, the philosophy of Socrates and the death of Socrates and the impact that Socrates has as we sort of transition from his beliefs into the beliefs of his student, obviously that being um, Plato. Hello everybody and welcome back to Ancient Philosophy. In this lesson we're going to be talking about Democritus, the next of our pre-Socratic philosophers. We're nearly coming to the end of the sort of era of pre-Socratic philosophy. And in this lesson we're going to focus specifically on one of the main um, aspects of Democritus' uh, general philosophy in his, uh, in his positing of the atom. So, more so than Empedocles, somebody who we examined in the last lesson, Democritus is known for a vast amount and uh, a vast amount of numerous different writings. So this is one of the things, again, that is quite interesting about uh, Democritus, as also is interesting about Empedocles. He is known to be somebody who um, was a prolific writer, who had written quite a lot of works. And the problems with this is that since we're talking about ancient philosophy and we are talking about pre-Socratic ancient philosophy, all of these writings are actually now lost. So we do have a number of small fragments in terms of his actual source material. And then we obviously have the later writings of um, people like Plato and Aristotle who have spoken about and talked about the kind of beliefs and ideas that are referenced by Democritus.
So while he is known for, or at least he is supposed to be known for and spoken about as having a, a vast array of different writing um, that that he had published, or uh, by published we mean in the kind of ancient philosophy sense, we only have a couple of tiny bits remaining and we have to really draw all of our understanding of um, Democritus from people like Plato and Aristotle. Now, the birth of Democritus is predicted to be around the date of 470 to 460 BC. We're not entirely sure exactly what year he was born, but we know that he was born on the Greek mainland between 470 and 460. And uh, above all else, Democritus was actually what we would describe, in fact, as a scientist. So, again, as referencing here from the ancient philosophy, there was obviously quite a, mu a lot of conjunction in terms of the traditions of science and the traditions of philosophy, they, they kind of mixed together quite significantly to the point where there weren't separate disciplines for science and for philosophy. But he was a successful scientist, as one would describe. Now, Democritus's theories effectively predicted the entire tradition of chemistry and nuclear physics. So uh, I, I'm making a very strong claim when I, when I say this, but it is actually true. I'm making the claim that uh, the prediction that was projected by Democritus's theories came into the world of chemistry and nuclear physics to the point where he essentially predicted the existence of the atom. Now, when we talk about positing the atom and the the things that Democritus did in 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 the actual um, presentation of of creating um, a a position for the atom, it should be noted that he he didn't exactly posit the atom in the sense of the atom that we describe to this very day. We don't know the actual thought process of Democritus in his positing of the atom and the existence of the atom, but we do have a basic understanding as taken from Aristotle. So what Democritus did was almost go against the grain of those like, for example, Zeno, who, 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 from we know from a lesson or two ago, posited a number of different paradoxes that related to the concept of infinity. So he believed that if one were to take a piece of material and begin to break it up, um, there must be some point where the material itself that has been broken up is indivisible. Now, this is, of course, contrasted with what Zeno believed with his paradoxes of motion, because Zeno's paradoxes of motion were uh, aiming to try and prove that things cannot be in flux. But in order to prove that, he relied on this concept of infinity, the idea that, for example, with one of his paradoxes, you couldn't get from point A to point B, because every time you travel from point A to point B, you have to travel half the distance, and then you have to travel half of that distance, and etc, 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 ad infinitum. And the idea being that if there is an, infinitely amount, an infinite amount of divisibility that is allowed when it comes to these kinds of measurements, when it, whether it be space, whether it be time, or whether it be some kind of material, then in that regard, then, there cannot be any kind of motion. That is what Zeno posited in his Paradoxes of Motion. But, but Democritus didn't believe in this kind of idea. He believed that if we were to break material up, there must be some point where we cannot continue to break the material up any further. There has to be a, 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 an indivisible point. And essentially, there cannot be the infinite division of a piece of material or a piece of space or a piece of time. And so he didn't believe that one could divide to infinity and be left with some material that does not have any quantity at all. So because this would simply mean that we we cannot divide by infinity. So the only conclusion, therefore, must be that there has to be some point where a material cannot be divided any further and there can't be any kind of um, any more division. That is the most indivisible point that, of existence for that particular material. So there must be some smallest possible point whereby the object cannot be further split. And in order to link this to the sort of modern conception of the atom that we have in chemistry and physics, Democritus actually used the word for indivisible to explain these tiny objects. The Greek word for indivisible is atom or atoms. And so therefore, in his um, theories of indivisibility uh, to a certain degree in, in terms of points that can be divided, um, what Democritus did was posit the existence of the atom. He believed that these objects are too small to be detected by the senses, but he did 
also believe that there were different variations of these objects and that these objects were timeless. So we do have a little bit of a of a breaking away from the actual scientific tradition that uh, that Democritus almost inspired with his beliefs, because um. Uh, in the in the first passage here, we note that he believed that they were too small to be detected by the sensors. That is true, of course. Atoms aren't things that we can detect with the sensors. Um, he also believed that there were different variations of atoms. Again, this is true. There are lots of different variations of atoms, depending on the number of protons that exist in a nuclei. So you've got uh, copper, nitrogen, uh, gold, etc., etc., etc. But the thing that obviously isn't the case is that the objects are not timeless. There is there is not any kind of special relationship between the atom and time. And so while it's a very rudimentary understanding of the modern science of the atom, it's a remarkable hypothesis for a pre-Socratic Greek philosopher to try and examine. And in terms of in terms of the prediction essentially democritus is right they did they do exist small things that cannot be divided any further of course now in modern nuclear physics we, we note that we can actually split the atom we can split the atom into its constituent parts and we can split the nucleus of an atom into into further subatomic particles as well but of course in the um all the way up until the 20th century before we could even posit the idea that we could even do that before things like the rutherford experiments we uh, believed in the existence of the atom and the atom was something that was indivisible and of course had lots of different variations so ultimately like i said here democritus was essentially correct in his hypothesis in at least the most fundamental part parts of the hypothesis the idea that there are things that can't be divided any further that we can't just divide ad infinitum to um uh, when it comes to different things related to space and time and and, and object and material uh, and materialism essentially but of course this is not a scientifically sophisticated theory in the sense that it would uh, stand up to any kind of scrutiny to this day so that's really where the majority of our um, of our understanding of Democritus's uh, contributions to science and philosophy really uh, really sits. For the most part, we would talk about his contributions to the existence of the atom and and the sort of contrast that he had with Zeno. But he did also come up with a number of other different theories as well. One related to the concept of modalities. So on top of the discovery of the atom, which I'm going to put in, I'm going to say in inverted um, inverted quotes, because obviously um, this is a, a theory that was posited thousands of years before the actual discovery of the atom. But before this, Democritus also believed in what we would describe as a plurality of worlds, which is a very interesting hypothesis. He believed that these different worlds were of different sizes and that these different uh, different worlds had contained within them different things. And of course, this would be a belief that would we can actually replicate when we talk about the modern metaphysics of mo, uh, of modality and modal realism the belief that there exists different possible worlds and that according to a strict interpretation of modal realism one that uh, or a lewisian um, interpretation of modal realism that these possible worlds actually are concrete realities that do exist and of course, again, it would be a mistake to suggest that the idea of the plurality of worlds presented by Democritus is in any way symbolic of this later modal metaphysical tradition. The idea that Democritus is talking about the um, philosophy of modality when he talks about the idea of there being a plurality of worlds, that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's doing. But he's positing the idea that there are different worlds of different contents and different sizes. Um, and this would be a this would be a theory that would be picked up by the metaphysicians of modality in the future. In this lesson, what we're going to do is talk about the final of our pre-Socratic philosophy that we're going to be examining in this course of lessons. Now, we're going to be talking about Protagoras as a uh, as a member of the sort of tradition that we describe as the sophists or, or the, the, the sophist tradition that exists. And so the aim in this lesson is to talk specifically about Protagoras as a philosopher um, in and of himself, but then to talk about broadly the, the sophist tradition that existed up to the period where we start to introduce the study of Socrates. So 
what we're actually doing in this lesson is coming to an end to pre-Socratic philosophy we've been studying for the past few weeks. And we're, we're going to outline a group of philosophical thought that we describe as the sort of sophist movement that existed within the pre-Socratic era. And it is encapsulated in this lesson by the work of Protagoras. Now, there are others that we could have focused on, and we will make reference to other sophist philosophers in this lesson. But we're going to uh, draw our attention specifically to Protagoras and some of his beliefs, but also the fact that his beliefs are part of this broader tradition that we are going to be talking about. So it's important that we sort of try not to separate too much the two different ideas. Now, many of the philosophers we're going to study when looking at the tradition of sophistry um, find themselves more, in fact, in Plato's dialogue than in any grounded historical works, which is quite interesting. So when we talk about Plato's dialogues uh, a little bit in the next few lessons when we examine Socrates, but obviously in a lot more detail when we examine Plato, what we notice that Plato's dialogues are conversations between different people. None of them are Plato. They're never Plato. They're different people. And a lot of the different people are actually a number of philosophers from this sort of sophist movement. And also, of course, Socrates plays a key role as well. So the tradition of the sophists rests fundamentally on the art and ideas relating to argumentation. The sophists were almost like teachers. They would go from city to city and they would train people in this sort of um, in the sort of ways of debate and the ways of argument and how to win an argument and how to uh, and how to 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 present your argument in the best light possible. Now, this is particularly useful to those who, of course, want to be politicians, who want to present legal cases in, in, in different areas of Greek society. So, of course, you could probably understand that the sophists had a certain amount of prestige in terms of being able to go from different places to um, sell their, their, their skills as debaters and argumentators and all these different kinds of things um, to different people who wanted to become better in the art of argumentation. And so central to the sophists and to sophistry being argumentation, we also have the um, the set one of the central figures within the sophist movement. And, and Protagoras was one of these central figures due to the nature of their work. The sophists were all particularly interested in the use and the utilization of language and linguistic tropes to win arguments or to present different debates and to present different opinions. Now, this is quite useful because what this does is it opens the door to the kind of philosophy that the sophists were known for contributing to. We're talking about the ideas related to language and linguistics. So according to Aristotle, for example, Protagoras himself was the first, in fact, to make a delineation between the genders of nouns in language. So a number of different linguistic traditions can actually be attributed to these um, different sophist um, philosophers. Which is quite interesting. It's quite unique in our studies so far. We've been talking about all the different contributions that different pre-Socratic philosophers sort of add to the world. We talk a lot about the cosmology. We talk about some inventions that some of them um, uh, could, uh, have contributed to. But at no point did we mention the uh, contributions to language that different philosophers have added in the pre-Socratic era. And in fact, the um, uh, the the uh, Sophist and Protagoras himself was one such person who actually did make a contribution to language, which is very interesting. He is also credited with being the first to distinguish different tenses in language as well. All of these being very, very basic ideas and very basic ideas that you would learn in a very um, uh, rudimentary English class today. But at the time, being able to actually um, codify and to actually write these ideas down is probably very, very interesting and very, very important to the traditions that were um, that were established as a result of the language um, progression that existed by people like Protagoras. Protagoras himself was a well-respected thinker and philosopher. He came to Athens as an ambassador. He was skilled in a number of different legal and political provisions, of course, again, deriving from the sophistry movement, deriving from the different sophists, of course, being good at arguments and argumentation will necessarily lend itself to being good at things relating to the legal profession and to, to politics. He famously have uh, said to have drafted a constitution for a colony in southern Italy. And in terms of what we know about what he said, there are a couple of everlasting quotes that we can uh, attribute to Protagoras that you might have even heard of before. So, for example, for example, sorry, um, 
when it first comes, uh, it comes to a piece that was entitled On the Gods. And in this piece, Protagoras outlines a certain amount of epistemic skepticism about the nature of the, the existence of the gods, which is quite interesting. There's a little bit of skepticism relating to the nature of the gods. They say that about the gods, I cannot be sure whether they exist or not, or what they are like to see, for many things stand in the way of the knowledge of them both the opacity of the subject and the shortness of human life. So again, this is drawing into uh, some of the metaphysical claims that we tend to make about the nature of God and we make about the nature of gods more generally, drawing into the kind of philosophy of religion aspects um, of, of, of the traditional philosophy that we will start to develop. So very interesting here, making a, making a claim about um, not just the epistemic skepticism relating to um, the existence of some kind of deity or deities in the plural in this instance, but also skepticism as it relates to empiricism, because he is arguing here that about the gods, I cannot be sure whether they exist or not, not based on any kind of rational, logical interpretation, like, for example, an ontological argument would um, prescribe, but rather looking at it through an empirical lens, through the lens of empiricism. He wants to know what they are like to see, what they are like as a result of our sensory perception. For many things are in the way of knowledge of them. He's making an epistemic claim. He's talking about epistemology, knowledge of the gods. And of course, we have both the opacity of the subject and the shortness of human life being two of the, um, the barriers that are in the way of being able to experience from an epistemic and from an empirical perspective the existence of the gods. A very interesting passage that can be picked apart in a number of different ways. In a much more pithy passage, uh, Protagoras believed to have said that man is the measure of all things, which is a very, um, a very common phrase that people tend to use every now and then, in, 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 even in, modern, uh, in, in a modern context. Uh, context, sorry. Uh, seemingly, while being innocuous, this passage looks to have hinted at a form of relativistic epistemology in the position with philosophy of knowledge that is still debated to this day. So even though the, the phrase man is the measure of all things is something that is used quite um, colloquially in terms of generally speaking about different um, subjects, but from a philosophical perspective, it's quite interesting that he is hinting at this idea of a relativistic epistemology. Of course, he wouldn't be describing and explaining it as a relativistic epistemology, but just like with all of these other pre-Socratic philosophers, they seem to have come up with ideas that will then be swept up and picked at as a real philosophical theory. But of course, the thing that is most known and most notable for these different philosophers uh, specifically within the sophist tradition is of course the art of argumentation protagoras and all the other sophists were said to claim expertise in the art of argumentation this is especially true of protagoras himself who believed he was able to make uh, to take the losing side of a debate and make it a winning side of the debate of course this is a, a, a skill that would be very very apt for anybody who wants to be good at arguing if they can take a losing argument and actually make it into a winning argument using different linguistic tropes and debate tactics then this is actually a good idea he would be able to coach an individual to make their side of an argument infinitely more convincing through the use of rhetoric and argumentation and debate and different linguistic ideas and different language um, tropes. Just like with other sophists, for example, Georgius, who was an expert in the art of debate and is also credited with the invention of a number of linguistic tropes. One such example of this sophist's uh, contribution to linguistics is the inclusion of the taxonomy of figures of speech, as well as the intervention, uh, sorry, the invention of the rhetorical question. The idea that you can present a question that is not meant to be answered or, or answered in any kind of way, but is meant to indicate some kind of further significance or to indicate some kind of problem with an argument. With a, or with a side of view or with a, with a theory that is posited. Before we finish, let's just talk about other sophists that existed. There were a great many of them who lived in this tradition, uh, many of whom we will become familiar with when we start to look uh, into um, Plato's dialogues when we, get to there, uh, when we get to there in a few lessons' time. Of course, we're going to be talking about Plato's dialogues, which means we're going to obviously be talking about a lot of the different sophists. Some of the sophists include people like Hippias. We have other sophists as well who you will become familiar with as we talk about the different things within um, Plato's dialogues. And if you've read 
any of Plato's dialogues, you will have known um, some of these different names. And with the idea that there are lots of different sophists that existed within this tradition comes a little bit of a problem in terms of the ways in which we can actually delineate the different theories of different sophist beliefs. So it's not always easy to divorce the individual beliefs of these philosophers from their characterizations in Plato's works. Because when we talk about the distinction between the historical aspect of these thinkers and the philosophical uh, and storytelling aspects that existed within the dialogues, it's not always easy to work out what this person actually believed from a historical perspective, their actual philosophy that has been passed down to us, and what Plato wanted them to believe for the purposes of one of his dialogues. This is something that will become patently clear when we talk about Socrates, because there is a distinction between the philosophical Socrates, as is presented in the works of Plato, and the historical Socrates, the actual man himself who lived and, uh, and died at a particular period of time. So when we talk about um, the dedication, um, the next few lessons being dedicated to possibly the greatest of all the sophists, arguably a sophist, that being Socrates, we're going to have to unpack and try and delineate between Plato's beliefs in these different ideas and also the different beliefs that the individual philosophers had. And with Socrates, this is ever more the case that it is um, very difficult to do because there's a lot of symbolic meaning in the inclusion of Socrates in Plato's dialogues and we will explain this in the next few lessons. Welcome to the first lesson for ancient philosophy looking at the philosopher known as Socrates. Now in this lesson and in the next few lessons about three or four lessons we are going to be talking about Socrates in great detail because he's the first of our major philosophical theories and philosophical thinkers who really essentially changed the game in in the in the sense of the kind of things that philosophers did and the kind of philosophy people actually engaged with we can generally uh, uh, limit or at least uh, dilute down the concept of ancient philosophy and especially ancient Greek philosophy into the ideas of Socrates, Plato and Aristotle and so it's important that we spend a good series of lessons discussing each of these three in turn now, like I've just said, this is going to be the first of many lessons exploring the philosophy of Socrates in great detail. In this lesson specifically, what we're going to do is just try to unpack the life of and history of Socrates from birth to his execution. And it's important that we do this because the life of Socrates is, is as interesting in some instances as his philosophy. And it's quite mythical in some senses, the, the history of Socrates, in a similar way to how we describe uh, the character of Jesus within biblical Christianity, we actually have to delineate between what we know about Socrates from a philosophical perspective and the kind of the idea of the philosopher Socrates versus the historical Socrates in the same way that we understand Jesus as being this character within Christianity and an, actually, and an actual historical figure. And there are actually two different modes of academia that discover and, dis, uh, and discuss these two different ideas. They're done in the same way with Socrates. And so in this lesson, we're going to talk about the historical Socrates in as much detail as we can, as limited as this information might be. So, in the history of philosophy, from the history of philosophy perspective, Socrates is a very paradoxical figure. So on the one hand, he is credited with being arguably one of the greatest philosophers who has ever lived. Uh, as some people even place him as high as, if not higher, than people like Plato. And so, so much of his previous, uh, of the previous philosophers are all collectively lumped together as the pre-Socratics. And I've spoken about the idea of these being the pre-Socratics in previous lessons. So that should go to show just how significant and influential Socrates is in the tradition of ancient philosophy, that all of the other philosophers that we've explored so far, Heraclitus, Parmenides, Thales, Anaximander, Zeno, um, Democritus, all of these different philosophers are lumped in as the people who were the philosophers that existed before Socrates. That Socrates is such an important uh, point of departure for it, when it comes to delineating different traditions within philosophy.
So we have that idea on the one hand. But on the other hand, there is not a single word committed to writing that can be attributed directly to Socrates. So on the one hand, he is credited with being this great philosopher, so much so that he actually defines the era of his uh, of the traditions before his own existence. But on the other hand, he never wrote anything down. Or if he did write something down, we don't have it anymore. So... How is it that we can have the greatest philosopher of all time, potentially, and one of, or at least one of the greatest philosophers of all time, not be somebody who we can actually attribute any kind of written word to? Moreover, there is little in terms of general quotations that we can actually attribute to Socrates himself. So not only do we not have any direct written material by Socrates that we can say Socrates wrote this, but there is also the problem of the fact that there is only a few generally uh, accepted quotations that we can say actually Socrates said this. So there's very little that exists in terms of whether or not we even know that he existed as a person, never mind any other um, actual philosophical ideas that can be attributed to him. Now we know that he existed as an individual person uh, for a number of different reasons, one of the reasons being that he is written about extensively by other people, namely, and most importantly, written about by Plato and then also by Aristotle. He's also written about by a couple of historians that we will talk about in a second. So we have the general idea that this idea of a man called Socrates, who taught a number of different philosophical ideas, existed as a person at some point in history. So we know that he at least that he at least at least existed, but anything more than that, and apart from a few little snip bits of history that we can uh, reference, anything more than that, we don't know. And so, despite this, I would definitely side on the fact that he is definitely credited and is rightfully credited as being one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived. And despite the fact that we don't have a single word committed to his writing, we can sort of infer the ideas that are written about him by people like Plato and we can sort of infer the significance in the meaning of why Socrates is written in certain dialogues versus other dialogues within the Platonic, um, within Plato's different um, works of academia. His life can be said to be determined by um, more by circumstances and his convictions than anything else. A lot of things happen to Socrates rather than Socrates actually being somebody who influenced in that kind of way. And what is important is it is his reaction to these circumstances that really define him as a, an important character within philosophy. And no more so is this the case than when we examine his death and his execution, which is what the thumbnail of this image uh, of this video is actually referring to. It's a, a painting about the death of Socrates. So let's just start to unpack the life of Socrates in more detail. So again, just like with the fact that we know very little about his actual philosophical beliefs, we also know very little about his life. It's very difficult if you're somebody who is uh, an academic who studies Socrates, um, either from a historical perspective or from a philosophical perspective, I'm sure you probably have a very difficult time of it because there's very little that you can actually say about Socrates' life and Socrates' philosophy. Again, it's not always easy to unpack the myth, the mix, sorry, of of actual history on this, the myth that is Socrates, the legend, as well as the philosophy from the works of all these ancient philosophers. And this is the case, we've noted that this is the case in previous examples as well. There are other pre-Socratic philosophers who wrote very uh, poetically in some regards, and so it became a little bit difficult to actually unpack what he believed versus what he was saying just to be a bit um, flamboyant in his writing. And Similarly, we have a similar kind of idea that we can unpack when it comes to Socrates. It's difficult to unpack the history with the myth and the legend uh, when it comes to his life. What we do know, though, is that he was born in around the year 469 BC, which was around a decade after the Persian invasions of Greece, the failed Persian invasions of Greece. And at the end of the Persian Wars, Athens went through a period of a golden age. We have an explosion almost in the ideas relating to arts, cultures, philosophies and histories. And it seems quite apt that the golden age of the Athenian period is actually linked a little bit, or at least it, 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 it coincides with the birth of Socrates and the development of Socrates' philosophy through the works of Plato and also with Aristotle as well. 
So it seems to be the case that this, the kind of golden age of classical Athens is sort of is situated around the time as these, uh, as these major philosophical thinkers existed. So, for example, uh, the, uh, the statesman Pericles uh, is, is arguably credited as being one of the people who introduced this golden age. We have, for example, democracy being introduced in Athens, something that was actually critiqued quite heavily by um, Socrates and Plato. At the time of um, the Golden Age, under uh, with around the life of Socrates, we also have works written by, for example, Herodotus, who was arguably the first of the historians. We have architectural pieces being uh, created. The Parthenon was built around this uh, time um, as well. So we see not just within philosophy, but also when it comes to the documentation of history with people like Herodotus, we have the ideas of um, history being written down. We have different political ideas with Pericles and the uh, in introduction of democracy into the Athenian state. And then we also have architectural masterpieces as well, like the creation of the Parthenon. When we talk about the history of Socrates and the life of Socrates, it's important that we actually examine one of the major things that we actually, uh, I believe we actually know for a fact takes place within the life of Socrates, and this is the Peloponnesian War. The Peloponnesian War takes place from around 431 to 404. Now, anybody who studies classics, who's watching this lesson and um, is doing a, a course in classics or studies ancient history, will know a lot about the Peloponnesian War. The Peloponnesian War was one of the most famous conflicts in ancient history, and it is certainly one of, if not arguably, the most famous in ancient Greek history, you may be able to make an argument for the Persian Wars, uh, or possibly, but I would argue that the Peloponnesian War is the most famous. It was fought between two leagues. It was fought between the Delian League, which was uh, led by the uh, Athenian state, and it was also fought between the Peloponnesian League, where it derives the name, which was led by Sparta. From a general colloquial perspective, those who have any idea of what the Peloponnesian War was would argue that it's, it was a war between Athens and Sparta, which is essentially how we can dilute the ideas down to. We can say that it is a conflict between Athens and Sparta. We're not doing classics on this, uh, on this YouTube channel. We're doing ancient philosophy, so we don't have to know the intimate details of the history. We know a lot about the Peloponnesian War, and we know a lot about the Peloponnesian War because it was written about by another very early historian, this historian being Thucydides. So for Socrates, though, because this is a lesson on Socrates, the Peloponnesian War was a period where he showed a great amount of courage. For example, during the Athenian defeat at the Battle of Delium in 424 BC, during the end of the conflict, Socrates actually held office in the Athenian assembly. This is where we see examples of Socrates holding and um, being, very, uh, being very stubborn almost in his moral and philosophical convictions regardless of the circumstances. Again, I mentioned early on in this lesson that circumstances will be imposed upon Socrates and his reaction to these circumstances are actually some of the things that make him so famous for his belief systems. And it is, it is his holding to his moral and philosophical convictions that provides ample evidence of this particular instance. He famously voted against the execution of commanders as a result of their unconstitutional trials within the Athenian state. So we know that the um, Peloponnesian War was a conflict, a war that Socrates actually was a part of. We know that he was part of things such as the Battle of Delium, uh, Delium sorry, in uh, 424 BC, and we also know that he held office towards the end of the Peloponnesian War as well. Notice that the Peloponnesian War was actually a very long conflict, 431 to 404. And when the Peloponnesian War came to an end in 404 BC, it actually brought defeat for Athens. And while the city-states of Corinth and Thebes demanded a complete destruction of the state of Athens, Sparta opted for the replacement of their democracy in favour of an oligarchy. So uh, anybody who, again, if you're studying classics, if you know anything about the, uh, the state of Sparta compared to the state of Athens, there's a very um, uh, ample distinction and delineation between the two different um, city-states, Athens being favourable in terms of democracy and Sparta um, introducing more of an, olig an oligarchy within their state. 
And when it came to the defeat of the Peloponnesian War, Sparta replaced Athenian democracy for um, Spartan oligarchy. And this became known as a reign of terror, the reign of the 30 tyrants, which took place after the defeat of Athens in the Peloponnesian War. Again, these are examples of circumstances that were imposed on people like Socrates, but that Socrates' reaction to these circumstances made it very, very clear that um, he was uh, definitely very significant in terms of his moral and philosophical convictions. During this period, he again held to his moral convictions and refused to accept illegal orders by the people in charge under this 30 tyrants period. Not long after this reign of terror, a revolution took place, and we actually see a restoration of Athenian democracy in response to this revolution. But this is not a good thing specifically for Socrates, because when we see the revolution of the uh, revolution against the Thirty Tyrants, and we see the restoration of democracy, we also see the fall of Socrates. And so, the fall of Socrates is arguably the most important aspect of his, um, or at least the most important example of him sticking to his convictions. His convictions, in fact, created a great number of grievances against him from all sides of the political sphere. A Democrat politician, Antus, um, created an indictment against Socrates, and this indictment read as follows. Socrates has committed an offence by not recognising the gods whom the state recognises, but introducing other new divinities. He has also committed the offence of corrupting the young. Penalty demanded death. So, of course... He was accused of doing all kinds of blasphemous kind of things. He was not recognizing the gods of the state. Instead, he was uh, uh, allegedly recognizing new religion and new divinity. Not much is known about the trial itself that takes place after the indictment. But what we do know is that he was found guilty by, in fact, a narrow margin. And in um, 399 BC, he drank a cup of hemlock, which is a poison, and um, would subsequently die. Now, the death of Socrates is a very important part of the tradition of ancient philosophy and in part of the tradition of ancient history because it really does show um, that the kind of person uh, Socrates actually was and the kind of person that was enshrined in, uh, in the kind of belief systems of people like Plato and Aristotle. And Socrates allegedly before drinking this um, cup of hemlock before drinking this poison um, wax lyrical about a number of different philosophical ideas relating to the nature of the soul and the dualist ideas of the soul uh, proclaiming that this is not actually death and and that his soul will live on um, somewhere else all of these ideas are both explored by plato but then expanded upon by plato as well and so in the next lesson, we're actually going to move away from the historical Socrates, what we've just talked about in this. And we will then talk about the philosophical ideas that have been represented um, by Plato in his dialogues, or, uh, the philosophical ideas of Socrates himself. Welcome everybody back to Ancient Philosophy. In this lesson, what we're doing is talking a bit more about the philosophy of Socrates. And we're going to be doing this through the lens of examining his character. I noted in the previous lesson that there are some instances where we can examine the character of Socrates and use that to inform our understanding of his philosophical opinions. And that is what we're going to do in this lesson. We're going to talk a bit more about the character of Socrates and how this does actually inform his philosophy. So as mentioned in the previous lesson, in terms of the life itself of, of Socrates, I'm sorry, we know very little about his life. We know that he had some involvement within the Peloponnesian Wars. We know that he was born uh, not too long after the failed Persian invasion of Greece. And we know also that he was around um, during the time of the Thirty Tyrants period, which was after the Athenian defeat in the Peloponnesian Wars. But we don't know that much more about his life. We also have a general understanding of how he died as well, and how he was um, executed or he he deliberately himself drank poison as a result of his charge of execution. And we know that the two main sources for the work of Socrates comes from the philosopher Plato. Of course, I mentioned in the last lesson that Plato referenced Socrates very heavily in his dialogues, and that's what we're going to talk about in the next lesson. 
But we also know a lot about uh, Socrates from the historian Xenophon. And of the two, it is the work of Plato that has made Socrates the household name in the world of philosophy. Of course, we don't know uh, anybody who studies philosophy and studies ancient philosophy would know about Xenophon the historian and how he wrote about Socrates, but we know more about Socrates from the work of Plato. Now, this is not to suggest that Socrates, as personified by Xenophon, does not suggest some philosophical influence that is of great merit to this day, just that the work of the philosopher Plato is more influential in the codification of Socrates as a philosopher who is now seen, and as, seen as and recognized as one of the greatest who ever lived. In this lesson, we're going to focus on the life of philosophy of Socrates, through the knowledge of Xenophon. So, before moving on to looking at how he is represented by Plato in the Platonic Dialogues, we'll talk about how he's represented by the historian Xenophon. And when we talk about the, the, the representation of Socrates through Xenophon, we are examining quite heavily the character of Socrates. So, as exemplified by Xenophon, Socrates is described in a four-book series of memoirs of Socrates that are titled Memorabilia Socrates, as well as a separate Socratic dialogue that is entitled Symposium. So we have here uh, quite a substantive piece of writing or set of works that are dedicated to the life and character and philosophy of Socrates, written by Xenophon. Now, this is significantly less work on the life and philosophy of Socrates than that of Plato. So while we have four book series here entitled Memorabilia Socrates, and we have also Symposium, when it comes to Plato's dialogue, he wrote at least 25, and 24 of those contain Socrates as a either minor or major um, character within the work and within the dialogues themselves. Socrates that exists in the work of Plato is also represented as more wise, metaphysical and profound than that of the works of Xenophon. So we have a distinction in terms of how his character is portrayed between these two different characters, between the uh, historian and the philosopher. According to Xenophon, Socrates was relatively heavily influenced by the idea of religion and spirituality and when we talk about the philosophy of Socrates we will reference the existence of God or the gods and so religion and spirituality is something that plays a heavy role in Xenophon's representation of Socrates. He would observe ritual and he would believe in the words of oracles. He believed intently in the existence of gods and the nature of those gods. His wisdom and spirituality does set him apart from early, uh, early other uh, philosophers, according to Xenophon, and we can attest to that claim when we talk about the pre-Socratics that we've examined. I've mentioned in previous lessons that where the pre-Socratics do reference heavily any kind of idea of religion and spirituality, this is seen as a little bit of a rarity. For example, um, all the pre-Socratics that we've examined, it was very rare that we would reference the fact that they were very heavily into this sort of spirituality and religion and theology. Instead, they were into more cosmology and looking at the, the character of nature and, and how nature has, is actually established and formated. Well, Socrates is set apart from the other philosophers in that regard, because he does have quite a strong and heavy sense of religion and spirituality, at least how Xenophon describes Socrates in his interpretations of, um, of his works. According also to Xenophon, he was unlike that of the sophists, since they would profit from their work and their teachings, and he was not like that of the early cosmologists, since he saw no interest in the early cosmology that these pre-Socratics um, uh, preached, essentially. So we see here that Socrates is setting himself apart from all of the other philosophers that have lived before him. The sophists would profit from their uh, work of teaching and, uh, and the style of argumentation and debate that they went around, um, they went around Greece trying to uh, teach people like lawyers and, and politicians and diplomats how to best be um, able to win debates and all these kind of things. And 
unlike the early cosmologists who had beliefs about the fundamental elements, things like Thales with water, and we have people um, who uh, believed in uh, the, the fact that the Earth was the fundamental of all the elements, and we have all of these different cosmological ideas about the sun coming into and out of existence every single day. Plato, sorry, uh, Socrates did not have any kind of um, great um, interest in these kinds of ideas. Rather, he was more interested in the spirituality and the concept of religion. Another aspect that Xen uh, Xenophanes actually um, references in quite a lot of detail is a documentation of the death of Socrates. One commonality that is shared by both Plato and Xenophanes is the belief that um, the trial and execution of Socrates was an unjust um, action. They both provide compelling arguments in support of Socrates. However, these were after the trial had taken place. So the trial and death of Socrates actually took place when Plato was a lot younger than is represented in a lot of the sort of common understandings of, um, of how the uh, events take place. And so therefore, when we see the writings of people like Plato and Xenophanes, we find that there is um, a, almost a post hoc justification of the beliefs that Socrates had, rather than actually trying to provide uh, some any, any kind of evidentiary um, standard or support for Socrates at the time of his trial and execution. So they were, they were post hoc justifying the beliefs that Socrates had, and um, post hoc condemning the um, death and the trial of Socrates. Xenophanes spoke of Socrates as a man who was innocent of the crimes he was charged with, and he believed that Athenian society should have respected his words rather than rejecting them. The Socrates of Xenophanes, um, though remarkably less influential than the Socrates of Plato, is still very influential in terms of the understandings of his death, the understandings of his trial, and the uh, ways in which he's represented as somebody who ought to have been respected by Athenian society, not somebody who ought to have been rejected. From what we know of Socrates using just the sources written by Xenophanes, he was not someone who stood out in any meaningful way among the philosophers that came before him. And it does go to show, and it maybe begs the question, of whether or not if we even had the Platonic Dialogues, if the Platonic Dialogues didn't survive, and we only had the works of Xenophanes um, to rely on when we're talking about um, interpretations of Socrates, how influential would we have placed Socrates within the grander scope of philosophy if we only had to rely on Xenophanes and we didn't rely on the, the dialogues from Plato? In that sense, we might come to the conclusion that he didn't stand out in any meaningful sense, in any meaningful way, compared to the other pre-Socratics that came before him. Or you might even come to the conclusion that there were pre-Socratics who were more influential than Socrates. And that would ultimately redefine the, 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 the period that we describe as the pre-Socratic period. Maybe we would take the view that Heraclitus was more uh, influential than Socrates, if that is, if we didn't have the dialogues from Plato to rely on. So we do see important influences, though, in the philosophy of religion. And I've mentioned before Socrates that was a spiritual individual. He was somebody who had a certain amount of belief in the gods. And at least this is uh, through the Xenophanes interpretation of Socrates. Interestingly, the Socrates of Xenophanes provides for what is possibly the first example of a design argument for the existence of God, an argument that is still used by uh, people who are of different religions around the world. He used the example of the human body, namely our senses, to declare that the body cannot have come into existence by mere chance, rather it had to have come into existence by some kind of design. He makes a reference to the eyes being sensitive to light, and that to counteract this sensitivity that humans have with the eyes, we have eyelids. And so this is almost reminiscent of things like the William Paley um, watch argument, the Paley's watch argument, the idea being that if you just were walking along a grassy knoll and you saw on the floor a, a, a pocket watch and you picked it up and you saw the intricacies and you saw the detail and you saw all of the things working in, in tandem with each other within a, within a pocket watch, you would come to the conclusion naturally that that pocket watch was designed and created by some kind of intelligent being. 
So you take that understanding and you expand that to the concept of the universe and you say, well, the universe seems to be perfectly designed, or at least the world seems to be perfectly designed for the sustenance of life and to sustain and to create life in some kind of way. So how can it be the case that we would argue that the pocket watch was created by some kind of intelligent being, but that the universe or that the world was not created by some kind of intelligent being? It had to have been designed by something and for something to be designed it requires there to be a designer and therefore god has some kind of existence that is the um the sort of modern interpretation of the the design argument for the existence of god and you can see that it re is very reminiscent of socrates's uh, beliefs in things like the the ways in which the human body operates in such a way as to be perfect for its surroundings we have the idea of uh, eyes being sensitive to light and to counteract this we have eyelids that can block out the light and so therefore all of this design within the human body um, couldn't have come into existence by some mere chance but rather it had to come into existence through some kind of design some kind of intelligent design now socrates of course, was not around during the time when we start to develop theories develop uh, related to um, to 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 uh, evolution and, and to natural selection and all these kind of things. So uh, that is an, an explanation for why these things come into existence by mere chance. But at the time, this is providing for a, a, a design argument for the existence of God. So. While this is admittedly a crude interpretation of the design argument for the existence of God, the essential elements are very much present. And you can compare this to, again, like I've just said, the, the design argument that is presented by William Paley. So, as a general summary then, the philosophy of Xenophanes uh, and the Socrates as represented by Xenophanes presents an idea of Socrates as somebody who is a lot more religious, a lot more spiritual. And we can compare that to the next lesson when we talk about the Socrates as represented by Plato, who is much more metaphysical, who is seen as much more of a wise oracle rather than somebody who is spiritual in nature. And we will discuss how we represent Socrates through the dialogues of Plato in the next lesson. In this lesson, what we're going to do is talk about the representation of Socrates through the lens of his student, this being Plato. It means looking into the dialogues that Plato has written and the dialogues that we actually have of Plato and examining the ways in which Socrates is represented and how this can actually have uh, insight into how we see Plato represent his own beliefs within these philosophical dialogues. So we're examining the philosophy of Socrates through the lens of Plato, essentially. Now, the things that we should just begin with by stating is just the descriptive realities of what uh, we can actually describe for the um, for, for the relationship between Socrates and Plato. Socrates is portrayed as a main character in a number of works that are written by Plato, and in a number of other works that are written by Plato, he's seen as more of a subsidiary character. And these are known as platonic dialogues. And really, this is where we get a lot of detail about the um, information related to his own philosophy and information related to his own beliefs. A dialogue, a platonic dialogue, is simply where Plato is um, codifying into writing a discussion that is had between uh, between two or more people. And it's normally between Socrates and maybe a student or a friend or a sibling of Plato. And they talk about different philosophical ideas. And you get a general sense of what these different thinkers believe within these different dialogues. Now, the extent to which these were actually beliefs that were had or that these were actually verbatim conversations that were had is a little bit more debatable but whether or not or compared to the idea that these dialogues were written by plato to express his own beliefs within philosophy but just doing it through the lens of dialogues between a number of different characters and the, the that second interpretation actually is very useful because what we see is that Plato will position Socrates as a character within these dialogues, usually having a conversation with a number of other sophists about issues within philosophy. So, for example, Plato's uh, 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 Georgius, um, in that dialogue, Socrates is positioned as having a conversation with a number of different um, sophists. We have Georgius and Cal uh, Calicus and Polus. 
all about having um, different philosophical questions relating to things like rhetoric and natural versus artificial justice. That is what that dialogue is explaining and describing within that conversation. And obviously you can understand that this is makes sense for 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 Socrates to have a conversation with a number of sophists about things related to rhetoric, because as we know that the sophists were very rhetorically effective and they taught in the art of argumentation. In another dialogue that is written by Plato, um, uh, Theatus, uh, Theatus uh, Socrates engaged in a dialogue with Protagoras, somebody who we've spoken about in previous lessons, about the nature and the ontology of knowledge, about epistemological questions. Again, Socrates is engaging these characters and is challenging these characters' ideas and these different belief systems, and in doing so is presenting a number of different philosophical ideas relating to whether it be natural versus artificial justice in one dialogue, or the ontology of knowledge in a different dialogue, or the nature of politics in maybe another one. And while Plato utilises Socrates in a number of his dialogues, it would be incorrect to say that there is a consistent variation of Socrates as presented by Plato. You could not draw a line of, uh, of, of consistency when it comes to what Socrates believed in from dialogue to dialogue, which further gives us indication that rather than these actually being general philosophical conversations that actually happened or beliefs that actually were presented, that instead Socrates and all of these other sophist characters were actually just placeholders that maybe did have these beliefs and did have some of these ideas, which is... Uh, again not inconsistent with this idea but that more the, it was more the case that these were just placeholders and these were characters that were used to present different philosophical ideas maybe to present ideas that were um, established by Plato himself so Plato would write Socrates in a number of different ways rather than trying to position Socrates as a consistent character across all of the dialogues. In some dialogues, Socrates is presented as being very critical of philosophical questions, but in other dialogues, he seems very keen to present his own interpretations on different philosophical ideas relating to, for example, ethics and morality or even metaphysics as well. And it would therefore be inaccurate to suggest that Socrates is somehow the main character in these dialogues. While he's presented as a, uh, as a very important figure, at least at the very forefront of the ideas that we are presenting, he is presented as a very strong figure within these dialogues to suggest that he is the main character or he is the main uh, protagonist within these different um, pieces of writing. That would be incorrect. I think it'd be inaccurate to make that conclusion. Because in a number of dialogues, Socrates plays a very minor role, uh, with other sophists taking centre stage within his different belief systems. And in a couple, he plays no role at all. So what we can do is we can take the representation of Socrates and try and make some claims about the thought process that was had by Plato. Some people argue, some classicists and ancient philosophers or ancient philosopher scholars uh, make the suggestion that Socrates, as written by Plato, could explain the representation of Plato's own thoughts and his own development within his own philosophy as presented through his representation of Socrates. So as Socrates plays less and less of a role within the dialogues, it is almost like we are moving away, transitioning away from what Socrates actually believed and going into looking at how Plato is presenting his own views within philosophy instead. So if we were to look at Plato's dialogues chronologically, again, the chronology of the dialogues is still something that is debated today, but we have a general understanding of some of the dialogues that uh, were earlier compared to some dialogues that came a lot later. We have a general idea of the chronology, but we don't have a very, uh, we don't have it 100% uh, um, agreed upon where the dialogue goes. But if we can look at the chronology of the dialogue, we can see that Socrates is represented less and less as time goes on. So ordering it chronologically, it appears that the later works written by Plato it seems that Socrates will either play a very minor role in those dialogues or will play no role whatsoever. And so this, seem, uh, this is seen by classicists and ancient historians as an example of how we can understand Plato signifying a break from the teachings of his, of his teacher, of his master, this being Socrates. So rather than 
in the earlier dialogues, what Plato is doing is maybe reciting the beliefs that are presented by Socrates when he's teaching and talking about these different ideas. And so Plato writes these down and has these dialogues as describing what Socrates believes. But the more we go on in the chronology, the further and further away from these beliefs um, we, that Socrates had uh, are being represented. And the more we are actually seeing the real true beliefs of Plato himself. So under this interpretation, we understand the dialogues as a development of Plato's own thought process. So he moves from regurgitating the words of his master, of his teacher, and then now is moving into the concept of now developing his own philosophy and his own philosophical opinions. This is just one interpretation that, again, classicists and ancient uh, ancient historians sorry, may have interpreted and could interpret as being what is significant about the Platonic dialogues. Now, there's no way of actually knowing. There's no way of knowing what any of these thought processes were about how fictional or how real these conversations actually were at the time that they were written. But what we do know is that we can actually pick out a number of different interesting philosophies from these ideas. We can also further support this interpretation when we look at what most scholars would agree are the earliest of Plato's dialogues. And these are Phaedo, Republic and Symposium. So, uh, the, the, these are actually also three of the most significant of Plato's dialogues, especially the Republic. We're going to spend a whole lesson looking at Plato's Republic on its own. And we will talk about Phaedo and Symposium when we examine his theory of the forms. So in these partic particular works, in Phaedo, Republic and Symposium, Socrates is presented not necessarily also as a, as, as a key character within the dialogues, but he's also presented as a teacher. So he, he plays a very heavy role, but he is also viewed through the lens of a teacher rather than somebody who's just having a conversation. And so a recent debate probably does place these dialogues a little bit more in terms of the middle grounds, in terms of the chronology. It is nevertheless very, very striking that there is a difference in terms of the occasions on which Socrates is present. So within the debates about which of these dialogues came first and whereabouts we can situate Phaedo, Republic and, and Symposium in his chronology. A, a more recent interpretations place them more in the middle of his uh, life of, uh, of the dialogues. But even still, it is interesting that he is presented not just as having a heavy role in these dialogues, which he does, but Socrates is also presented as somebody who is teaching in these dialogues. So it is almost like Plato is representing and regurgitating the beliefs and the teachings of Socrates rather than challenging those beliefs or coming up with those some beliefs of his own. So this idea of a middle ground therefore does suggest that one can delineate the dialogues written by Plato into three distinct categories. So we can actually take the chronology and we can split them up into three different categories. Uh, this is something that we will look at more in detail when we examine his own philosophy in a, in a future lesson. But when we talk about the transition from Socrates to Plato, it is not as solid a transition as the as the transition that we will come on to when we look at the transition from Plato to Aristotle. Aristotle obviously writing his own works and writing them down. Socrates was somebody who has never written down anything that he has said. So it is quite hard, as I've mentioned in previous lessons, to unpack what Socrates actually taught and believed with what Plato is representing Socrates as teaching and believing and what Plato actually believed himself. Welcome everybody back to Ancient Philosophy. In this lesson we are going to be taking an introduction to the next of our philosophers. We've spent a few lessons going over the works, well I say the works, none of it was actually officially written down, but the beliefs and ideas and the representation of Socrates and this is mainly through the works of Plato. But in this lesson what we're going to do is talk about specifically Plato himself and we will be spending the next three, four, maybe five lessons on Plato, because he's arguably one of the most, if not the most significant of these ancient philosophers that we're going to be examining. So we're moving away from the philosophy of Socrates and onto the philosophy of Plato. So as an introduction, in Plato's work, uh, the Phaedo, you could almost um, be seen, uh, you could almost see this work, sorry, symbolically as a transition away from Socrates to a more Platonist philosophy. And it's quite interesting 
um, the ways in which we can interpret the works of Plato and the beliefs and the philosophy of Plato through the different works that he is that he that he writes through the dialogues and how we can describe and delineate between the works that we can attribute to Plato versus the ideas that we can attribute to Socrates and it is in this work that Plato details the last few days of Socrates' life when he eventually will um, succumb to drinking um, a poison, drinking the cup of hemlock. This is something that we have already explained and, and, and looked at and analysed in, in great detail. And so this is represented in, di in Plato's dialogues in the Phaedo. Now, it's also an example um, within this work that Plato introduces a number of new ideas. So, for example, the uh, almost the official introduction of the theory of the forms, which we're going to dedicate an entire lesson to in a future, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, um, this is actually all uh, introduced in the Phaedo, or at least it's introduced in more detail in the Phaedo. So you could almost understand the symbolic representation of the Phaedo, the specific dialogue that we have, you could almost suggest that it is not just representing and documenting the end of the life of Socrates, but also the end of the philosophy of Socrates and the introduction, introduction sorry, of a new era of Platonic philosophy, of Platonist philosophy. So we have to remember that Plato was actually quite young when Socrates would die and would uh, succumb to the drinking of hemlock. And when Plato starts to represent this in his dialogues, we see that the what we were what we believe to be the earlier works of Plato featuring Socrates very very heavily. And you could almost understand this as being the, the, the philosophy of Socrates being represented in these earlier dialogues. And as we go into the Phaedo, we are representing not just the death physically of Socrates, but the death philosophically of Socrates. And so as a result, and, as, and since the, the, the dialogue, the Phaedo, the, um, what we believe to be dialogues that come after that, Socrates plays less and less of a heavy role within the actual works, within the dialogues themselves. Now, this is not to suggest that the work of Socrates will not be important in Plato's dialogue since Phaedo, but just that he um, may be representing the death of uh, Socrates within this dialogue, he might choose. He might have chosen to represent it in this dialogue, as also and also choosing to introduce new theories like the theory of the forms, as sort of almost like a representation of a move away from Socrates into his own philosophical ideas. This may be one way in which we can interpret the Phaedo. And Socrates will still remain an important figure in the life of Plato, even after his death, and even after his death is represented in the dialogues, but we still notice that this is quite an interesting way in which we can represent the sort of symbolic transition away from Socrates into Plato. Just like Socrates, it is actually quite difficult to separate the fact from the fiction when it comes to the life of Plato. So if you remember back when we looked at Socrates, we had to explore the delineation between the philosophical Socrates and also the historical Socrates. Socrates being the, uh, from an historical perspective, we know that he had some involvement within the Peloponnesian War. We know that he existed and lived around the time of the 30 tyrants within Athenian society following the defeat of Athens in the Peloponnesian War but other than that we don't know too much else just like that with Plato we don't really know much more than a few key pieces of historical information so what do we do know well we do know that Plato himself was born into an aristocratic Athenian family and would have been in his late 20s by the time he witnesses the death of Socrates. And that's quite interesting if we think about the the um, the painting, the death of Socrates, that is represented in a couple of the thumbnails that we have for the Socrates lessons. We notice that Plato represented in that painting is actually very, very old. And so you can actually draw some conclusions from the idea that it, rather than the death of Socrates actually representing the image and the actual thing that has taken place at the time, it could almost be seen as a memory of uh, the death of Socrates from an older version of Plato. Quite why the artist in that painting 
decided to represent Plato as being elderly when in reality he was been in around his 20s when Socrates actually dies is quite interesting and it's something that um, you can um, or art historians and people who analyze art can really uh, dive into if they really want to. We also know that Plato had two brothers. He had Glaucon and Adam, Adam, Adiamantus, and um, they had both also fought in the Peloponnesian War, just like with Socrates. And despite this, there's very little, if any, mention of the Peloponnesian War, specifically in Plato's writings, which is actually quite interesting, because the if we were to think of um, a Grecian society and Athenians, Athenian society and ancient Athens and the sort of the history of ancient Greece, there are a few very notable key instances of key events that take place that are very, very important to the history of ancient Greece. So you have, for example, the Persian Wars. You have, for example, Alexander the Great. You have, for example, Hellenistic Greece. Uh, and we also have the Athenian society within the sort of uh, the golden age of uh, society and culture uh, around the time of Socrates. And another one of these is, of course, the Peloponnesian War. So what is quite interesting is, despite the fact that the Peloponnesian War would have been probably the most significant or one of the most significant events in and around the life of Plato, it is very little, there is very little mention of it in any of Plato's dialogues at all. So it is notably and noticeably removed from Plato's writings. There is much speculation as to why this may be the case. As I've just said here, it seems a bit odd that the, probably the most significant event in and around the life of Plato is just not mentioned. But what we do know is that when the Peloponnesian War ended, we enter into a period of the 30 tyrants, if you remember. We, uh, we see that Athens uh, is defeated by a number of other, uh, the city, uh, the Delian League, the other city-states um, that existed. And we see that um, other states like, um, uh, city-states like Sparta um, come in and they uh, introduce uh, and they remove the democracy from Athenian society. And we see the introduction of the 30 tyrants period. And there may be some kind of familial connection to the 30 tyrants when it comes to Plato himself, since he was born into an aristocratic Athenian family. So some of these may be the reasons why we don't see that much reference, or if any reference at all, to the Peloponnesian War when it comes to Plato's writings. So... Another um, further instance of this is that two of the 30 tyrants were actually uncles of Plato. So just to get an idea of just how uh, aristocratic Plato was within Athenian society, two of his uncles were two of the 30 tyrants. And so continuing on about the life of Plato, we know that when he was around the age of 40, he would travel to Sicily. Um, when he was in Sicily, he would uh, become an associate uh, of the brother-in-law of the monarch of Sicily, who was Dion, uh, Dionysius I. And when he would return to Athens, he would found the Academy, which is really the painting that we see on all of these lessons above us right here. And this is essentially a place for those to, quote, do philosophy. And this is uh, where a lot of his ideas relating to Plato and Aristotle can be traced. Aristotle existing within the um, the academy as well, Aristotle being one of those central figures in the paintings that you can see above the text right here, the older gentleman being Plato, the younger one being Aristotle, the student of Plato, and who would eventually become the teacher of Alexander the Great. And during the rest of his life, Plato would travel back and forth to Sicily. And we know as well that he had um, quite a very long life, so he would die around the year 347 BC, which would place his death and the, his age at the time of his death to be around that of the age of 80. So that's what we know about Plato's life. What about the works of Plato that we can actually talk about? Well, we've explained explored some of them in previous lessons because it's very difficult it's in nigh impossible to try and talk about socrates as philosophy without referencing plato seeing as that's where most of it is written but it is believed that there are no works that are written by plato that are lost to history which is actually a first when it comes to ancient uh, philosophy we don't have there are no um uh, unfound or, or or destroyed pieces of writing that we can attribute to Plato. We have 
I, so that means that we either have all of his writings or we have the vast, vast, vast majority of them. And so, therefore, we have got a very strong connection to all of the works that we have for Plato and his all of his philosophy. So we believe this to be the case since we don't know if there of any other reference to a work by Plato that we do not have. So there's not some mysterious reference to another one of his dialogues in some of the works that we already have or maybe some of the works of Aristotle or, or, or anything like that. And so by that reference, we understand that he's probably there isn't probably any other uh, writings that um, have been lost to history. Now, of course, if... The, if there is writings that are lost to history, it's impossible to ever know if that's the case. But at least in terms of references within other dialogues, we don't have a reference that we cannot trace to an, a dialogue itself. And I've mentioned dialogues because that's how Plato would write. He would write in the form of dialogues, meaning that Plato would really appear himself as a speaker in his own writings. And instead, he would opt for the writing of dialogues for others that he was associated with. So... This does sometimes make things a little bit more complicated when it comes to actually trying to unpack the philosophical beliefs of Plato, considering that if he isn't the one who is actually present in any of the dialogues, it's not entirely clear which of his philosophical ideas we can actually truly associate with him and which are the ideas of others uh, within the philosophical circles, which is quite interesting why we I made reference to this sort of symbolic transition from Socrates to Plato earlier on in the Phaedo, because it's quite interesting that you can attribute a lot of the ideas um, that are presented by Socrates in Plato's dialogues to Socrates. You could probably make that claim. But then to what extent do we move away from Socrates' own beliefs and actually into Plato's own beliefs? So this really is was uh, this sorry really was a uh, an introduction to the lessons that we're going to be doing on Plato for ancient philosophy. We're going to unpack the uh, the philosophy of Plato across a series of different lessons and we're going to draw our attention to a couple of very important aspects of his philosophy. So we'll begin by talking about his theory of the forms which is presented in Phaedo, Symposium and a number of others, uh, a number of other works. We will actually reference every work that it is um, referenced in and it is also referenced explicitly in a couple, uh, a couple of letters. So that's what the next lesson will be talking about the theory of forms. We will then also talk about Athenian society and a just society and political society as represented in the Republic, which is another one of Plato's very important works. And then we will talk about some of the later philosophical ideas and ideas that will replace the ones presented in Plato's Republic in a in a third lesson. And I believe I probably will do a fourth lesson on probably the most important of the things that we remember from Plato and Plato's works. And that is, of course, his allegory of the cave, um, again, represented in the Republic. I'll see if we uh, we have time to put that into a lesson as well. If not, we'll make that an extra lesson in the future. But these are the main three lessons that we're going to be structuring and dedicating to the work of Plato. We'll talk about the theory of forms. We'll talk about the Republic. And then we'll talk about some later philosophical ideas in the final lesson. In continuing our study of the philosophy of Plato, we're going to focus on one of his most fundamental theories of philosophy, this being his theory of forms or his theory of ideas. Now, this is probably the most important of Plato's philosophical ideas. It's up there with possibly his allegory of the cave, but there's actually quite a good link between Plato's theory of the forms and the allegory of the cave as well. The allegory of the cave is almost an explanation in some ways of his theory of forms to an extent. But the theory of forms more generally is one of the most important and fundamental. Now, in this lesson, we're going to dive into these philosophical beliefs and we're going to draw very heavily from his dialogues, as well as some other sources where he explicitly explains what he means by the theory itself. So while arguably the most famous of the dialogues that we can attribute to Plato is the Republic, which is what we're going to explore in the next lesson, this theory of forms, which is found across a number of his different writings, including a little bit in the Republic, can, is what really is seen as his most important philosophical contribution. At least in my opinion, it is one of, if not the most important philosophical contribution. Now, the idea of the theory of forms is not something that is explicitly stated and described in his dialogues. There are only references to 
uh, the to the theory of forms and it's almost explained in the dialogues as if it was common knowledge so it's not explained as if it's something that is new to the reader it's almost explained as if okay this is how the world operates and you ought to know that already almost but quite interestingly in one of Plato's letters that is uh, supposedly attributed to Plato, now there is some academic debate as to whether or not Plato actually wrote this letter. We do find, though, in this, a much more apt explanation of the theory of forms. So I think what it's important to do is to dive into that letter first, assuming that this was attributed to Plato, despite the fact that there is some academic debate going back and forth about whether or not Plato actually wrote this letter. Because the reason why is because it does give a more apt explanation of actually what the theory of forms is, rather than just accepting it as read, which is what happens when we talk about it in the dialogue. So it's described as Plato's seventh letter, and it's the seventh letter of Plato, and it is by far the longest of the epistles that are commonly attributed to Plato. So the letter itself offers an autobiograph uh, autobiographical account of Plato when he was in Sicily. Don't forget, in the last lesson, we explored the life of Plato. And during his life, when he founded the academy, he would travel back and forth to Sicily and would often um, interact with a number of individuals there. And this was written after the assassination of Dion, the tyrant of um, Sucrus in Sicily. Uh, by somebody known as Callippus. This was done around the year 53 CBC. So the letter itself was written a little bit around or after 53 C, uh, 533, sorry, 353 BC. And towards the end of the letter, so between um, uh, the sections 341b and 345c, we see Plato go off on a dis digression about the theory of forms. So he's talking about all kinds of different things, and he then just goes off quite, um, quite uh, tangentially on a bit of a tandem to looking at the theory of forms. And when discretion about the theory of forms in the letter, Plato is actually challenging challenging, sorry, uh, Dionysus of uh, Sacrus, who claimed to be, he claimed to be an imposter. Now, he made a claim that they had produced a treatise on metaphysics that were allegedly superior to Plato's, and that Plato claimed that truths about metaphysics were unable to be expressed in the form of writing. So this is sort of the, the this is sort of the preamble to where we start to get a description of the theory of the forms. And then he goes on to explain the nature of truth and the characteristics of knowledge. So he makes a lot of links to things related to metaphysics as well as to epistemology. So this is where we start to get an indication of what Plato is talking about in his seventh letter. He claims that a thing which can be known and recognized must have four characteristics. It must have a name, it must have an account, it must have an image, and it must um, be something that we have knowledge of. These are the char four characteristics of things that can be known. The first two of these characteristics can be expressed in the form of writing. So, for example, this is how Plato would go about this kind of uh, thought process. An apple is the name of a particular object. So we would describe an apple as the, uh, we would describe or at least uh, associate the word apple with the object that we're applying, i.e. giving it a name. And then when we talk about the account, what Plato is explaining here is the account of an object is the description of an object. So for an apple, you could, um, so for the first two in writing, we could name an apple and we could describe what it is like. It could be green, it could be blue, it's, uh, sorry, blue, it could be green, it could be red, <laughs> not blue. Um, it could, it's uh, often um, a bit of a, a, a spherical shape, the few bumps, there's a, a, you know, there's there's seeds in the middle. These are ways in which we can uh, describe the account of an apple. The next is sensory experience. This is the third characteristic that is required. This is an image of an apple. So we actually have to see the apple itself and actually have to see what we are talking about. So while we can, I could give you a name of an apple and I could describe what the characteristics of the apple are and you would never need to actually see an image of it to, uh, to have knowledge of those two characteristics. The third characteristic required is to actually have visual um, experience, to have some kind of sensory experience of the object.
And then the final characteristic is the most detailed, it is knowledge, something that can only be known with reference to the satisfaction of the other three. But when Plato says, um, then Plato says that this fourth characteristic is what is required for an object of knowledge. And then what we see here is Plato goes beyond the four characteristics and actually describes what he calls the fifth. Now, the fifth will differ from the other four in a number of different ways, the fifth characteristics. On the one hand, it will differ from the name and the account of the thing, since there are these are only descriptions of the quality and not the essence of the thing. So if I'm describing to you the name of an apple and I'm giving you a description of what an apple is, I'm giving you... Uh, descriptions. I'm giving you very fundamental surface level descriptions. I can't explain to you in writing or, or, or through description the essence of a particular object. This is something that requires the fifth. Equally, it will differ from sensory uh, perception since the fifth is a fixed sense of an object, whereas the sensory perception of the object is relative. So I could see an apple from a lots of different angles. I could see an apple from far away. My senses can be deceived. Whereas when we talk about this fifth characteristic, the fifth characteristic is a fixed objective sense of the object, of the apple itself. So this idea of the fifth, as written in Plato's seventh letter, is what we would describe as the theory of forms to this day. And it is what is sort of sprinkled throughout a number of his dialogues. So what the theory of forms tells us is, and what the theory of forms means is it is representative of uh, an objective element of some object that we could have knowledge of. It differs from knowledge itself because in the sense that knowledge may be subjective and dependent on the notion of the mind. So there's a lot of interaction between the object itself and the mind and the sensory perception of the object when we are just talking about knowledge of. Whereas the form of an object in this theory of forms is a mind independent entity and it is a fixed objective notion. It is not subjective. This theory, therefore, can be extracted into a more metaphysical understanding about reality. It is important to note that the physical world is not necessarily as real as this unchanging nature of the forms or nature of ideas. So but Plato makes a delineation almost between the idea of the real world existing, but also the world of the theory of the forms, the world of the forms or the realm of the forms, where we have a much more fixed, objective, perfect understanding of each of the things that exist in the physical world. The physical world is incomplete almost. It is not perfect compared to the realm of the forms. So continuing on. Plato will invoke language that seems to describe that the forms in multiple different dialogues. So from me, uh, from Mino to uh, Philebus, the two dialogues that sort of bookend this theory of the forms, we see a number of different references that are made to it. Most of the references that are made about the forms are often very spurious and very sure. Again, it's almost like Plato assumes that we already know what we're taught, what they're talking about. It's almost like they, he already assumes that we already have knowledge of, or we understand what he means when he talks about the theory of the forms. So he just describes it as if it's knowledge that we already have. But where more dense explanations of the forms exist, one finds Plato describing a kind of realm or almost a, a, a separate world where the forms are said to exist. So for example, in Phaedo, the world of the forms is described as being a location above the surface of the earth, which is quite interesting to know. And uh, in, um, in Phaedrus, uh, another one of his dialogues, he describes the forms as a place beyond heaven. Again, another very interesting um, uh, interpretation. And when it comes to the different interpretations from modern philosophy, uh, a philosopher writing about metaphysics of morality, Iris Murdoch, emphasizes that Plato is probably not talking about a literal location in time and space that is almost separate and distinct from the reality that we're talking about here. So he draws on a comparison between Plato's language in these different dialogues and the idea of heaven within the Christian doctrine. So while we do see that Plato references and makes explicit claims about the forms being a place beyond heaven and almost describes it in the Phaeto as existing uh, above the surface of the earth, 
it might not be the case that he's describing literally a place that is above the the earth in a similar sense that um or, or at least in a way that you can compare to the christian doctrines of heaven so they say that there is no platonic elsewhere similar to a Christian elsewhere. I think most Christians would come to the conclusion that when they die, there is actually a, a location in space and time somewhere necessarily where they will go and they will go in this place they would describe as heaven. This interpretation is supported by Plato's writing. They didn't just pluck this idea out of thin air, the idea that um, this is a, a an actual concrete world. For example, in Symposium, uh, Plato says that it is not anywhere in another thing. It is an animal or in as is as in an animal or in earth or in heaven or in anything else, but itself by itself with itself. So this is a, a very uh, cryptic, uh, poetic interpretation uh, written in Symposium. But it does give us an idea that probably Plato isn't talking about a real realm of the forms. He's talking about an idea, that the idea of there being a realm of the forms, the idea that there being a, an existence of the perfect interpretation of the essence of ideas, the essence of knowledge, rather than just our incomplete and unsatisfactory understanding of objects around us, like an apple, for example, like what we've been describing. Here, what um, we're referring to specifically is about the form of beauty in Symposium. And this is the, actually the only reference that is made to the forms in, in Symposium. So it's quite light on the, the theory of the forms in um, his dialogue Symposium. Now, the biggest problem with Plato's theory of the forms is that Plato himself is often inconsistent in his descriptions of it. So it's actually been left to philosophers since Plato to try and build on his ideas because Plato himself, again, references it as if we already know it. And he's very inconsistent with how he references it. There's never a fully explained version of his theory in his dialogues. The only real explanation comes from the seventh letter we've, that we've explained and to some extent, some people argue that the seventh letter isn't something that can be attributed to Plato at all. But assuming that it is, it's quite interesting that one of Plato's most important theories that is sprinkled across all of his dialogues is actually never explained in the dialogues themselves. In the heaviest references to the forms, we see um, the, the heaviest references being in Phaedo and Republic. Uh, Plato doesn't necessarily explain the theory in any great detail, again, but rather takes it for granted that the reader is already familiar with the concept. And so, to some extent, we could make the argument that Plato's theory of the forms is something that has been developed more by people post-Plato than by Plato himself in his dialogues. He references it, and he is obviously the, it is obviously the genesis of this idea comes from Plato. But our ideas and, and how we can actually link it with modern metaphysics is something that has been attribute, you can attribute to other philosophers as well. So one inter interesting interpretation is that Plato's theory of forms is actually a rudimentary explanation of universals within modern metaphysics. So this is the idea in metaphysics that objects have certain properties and there is a certain amount of universality that is attached to said properties. So according to a universal uh, interpretation of metaphysics, the concept of beauty is something of a universal. It is a property that we can share across other objects. So for example, as well, let's use a more practical, less abstract idea. So not beauty, let's talk about something like color. The color green is said to have some kind of universality because one of the things, if we take a number of different green objects, we take an apple, we can take some grass, for example, uh, et cetera, et cetera, take a green pen or a green highlighter. We can look at all of these different objects. We note that all of these different objects are in fact different. They have differences across them. But we also note that there is a thing that sort of links them all together. And this is the concept of greenness, the property of greenness. So the concept of universals links this idea that there are multiple different properties or there are similar properties that can be uh, attributed to multiple different objects. We do have a series of lessons on metaphysics and a series of lessons on this topic more specifically. So if you want to know more about universals and, uh, and, uh, and nominalism and all these other kind of ideas related to properties, um, be sure to look at our metaphysics playlist for more information. So that's our understanding of the theory of forms. We will come back to the theory of forms when we explore Plato's allegory of the cave. But in the next lesson, what we're going to do is explore uh, Plato's Republic and talk about some of the key themes that took place within that particularly important dialogue.
Hello everybody and welcome back to Ancient Philosophy. In this lesson we're going to carry on talking about the works of Plato. The previous lesson explored his theory of the forms and explored them within the context of various different dialogues. So we talked about um, how he explains the forms firstly in his seventh letter, which is actually something that is not a dialogue and is uh, questionable whether or not it even is something that we can attribute to Plato himself. But then secondly, we looked at it through other dialogues like the Symposium, Phaedo, etc, etc. And in this lesson, we're going to talk about not a theory that is something that spans across different dialogues, but we're going to focus on one dialogue in particular, and this is his Republic. Now, it is arguably the most important of Plato's works. Now, this is something that we can caveat quite interestingly because we could um, argue that this is for, for those who are studying Plato's ideas when it comes to political philosophy, then you might say that Republic is his most uh, important work. But for other theories and for other ideas, you might say that other dialogues are more, more important. But for the most part, people would remember the Republic as one of, if not the most important of his works. It is a philosophical masterpiece that outlines a number of different key principles and ideas with huge philosophical ramifications that will be explored by thinkers for thousands of years. Now, it is no secret that a lot of philosophers argue that the idea of Western philosophy entirely should be seen as just a footnote to the work of Plato. And it is the kind of masterpieces that we see when we talk about the Republic and Symposium and Phaedo that actually give credence to that theory, to give credence to that claim. Now, it's a work that we see um, has much deeper explanations of his theory of the forms. So we actually see within the Republic a lot of his ideas related to the theory of the forms be explored in more detail. But it also has a number of different political prescriptions. It, the work itself was authored by Plato in around the year 375 BC. And the main theme of the work, the Republic, is on the issue of justice. So what this lesson is going to do is explain uh, briefly the, the way in which the work is structured and the ideas that are discussed within the work and just basically do a, a, a very um, overview like survey of the Republic itself. And then we'll talk about some of the ideas and some of the really key important things relating to specifically his political theories when it comes to um, how it is represented in, in, in Republic itself. So when we talk about the idea that Republic is something that uh, talks a lot about the issue of justice. The main questions that are asked within this dialogue are what constitutes a just society? What constitutes a just city-state? And what is a just individual? So we talk about justice along three separate uh, dimensions. We talk about the concept of a society from a macro perspective, the idea of a just state, and as well as this, the idea of just individuals. So as we note that justice is a very important concept for Plato in this uh, in this work, in this dialogue. Book one will set out a number of different conceptions of justice that are established by Socrates. So Socrates does play a very key role within the dialogue. Multiple examples are stated, and while Socrates does acknowledge that these ideas can be considered almost common sense definitions of justice, he will then go on to argue that all of these definitions of justice are actually inadequate definitions. This does not entail a rejection of these definitions by Socrates, but rather the prescription that there ought to be a more incorporated um, definition that needs to be examined. So while he is critical of the definitions that he gives and the examples that he states within book one, he does not suggest that these are things that we need to throw out, but that we need to um, actually incorporate more within the definition. Book two begins with Plato's brothers, Glaucon and Adimantius, and they challenge a proposing definition of justice that therefore challenges Socrates. So they challenge a proposing definition um, and therefore um, start to disagree with Socrates. And this is where we start to see the dialogue begin to take shape. The argument that they present is that justice exists and is chosen as a contravention of unjust actions. 
So the way in which um, the brothers of, uh, of Plato actually define justice is not necessarily through a positive um, description of justice by actually explaining what justice is, but rather by suggesting that justice is the contravention of unjust actions. They explain that if individuals were able to act unjustly with impunity, they would do so. So there is not necessarily a desire to act in a way that is just and it is fair and it is it, it would, that would prescribe yourself as being somebody who is acting with justice. If you could act unjustly and you could do so with impunity, then according to Glaucon and Adamantius, Adamantius sorry, um, impunity therefore means that you would do so. It is the fact that you cannot act with impunity to act unjustly that leads to people acting justly. So therefore, accountability is established whereby an individual would not be able to act unjustly for fear that this would merit some response from others, namely a pejorative response from others. They also make the positive claim in this regard, suggesting that people also act justly in response to the rewards they gain from such action. So in explaining how people act justly and more importantly why people act justly, what the brothers of Plato are suggesting is they do so because of the external um, pressures that they would get from a society, from other people within society. They argue that you do so because if you act unjustly, you would um, receive negative response. And by extension, if you act justly, you will receive positive um, uh, gratification, essentially. Then Socrates will respond to these claims in the dialogue. Firstly, by suggesting that the two are incompetent, uh, but then by positioning the discussion about justice as a discussion about justice in the city-state more broadly. So you might think that what Socrates does at this point in the dialogue is, first of all, he insults the, uh, the, the brothers of Plato, which is nice. But then secondly, what he does is he almost pivots away from talking about justice within individuals and he talks about justice within the city-state more broadly. And the reason for this, you might think, is quite a squirm uh, tactic within an argument. In reality, what he is doing is trying to show that their conceptions of justice, the, 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 the brothers of Plato's conception of justice, is actually one that is misguided. And he says that in order to show the misguided uh, aspects of this uh, view of justice, in order to do so, we must look at it from a more macro perspective. And you'll be able to see why you are so incompetent, according to Socrates. Socrates argues that in order for the two to understand justice of the individual, they must take the macro understanding of justice, apply uh, the principles of justice to the idea of the city-state. And so this is what we get from the dialogue itself. Uh, first in cities searching for what it is, and then thusly we could examine also in some individual, examining the likeness of the bigger in the idea of the littler. So he's talking about taking a broader example and being able to understand the broader, broader example and understand the likeness between the broader example and the more micro individual example. So the distinction between the city state and that of the individual. So now that we're examining justice from the perspective of the city-state, Socrates then outlines essentially a vision for a totalitarian society. And this is really where we start to bring into the fold a number of different political ideas. He believed that those who were classed in the rank of the soldiers were those who are best suited for ruling within society. They come from the upper class of society and they are able to compete in such a way as to be able to rule over the rest, the lower classes. So he believed that in a, in a, in a perfect society, those who are the top of society have to compete to be able to rule the rest of the lower society. According to Socrates, there ought not be any social mobility stating that people ought to remain in the class in which they were born. So there ought not to be situations where somebody from the lower class works and they make their way up to the upper classes and the vice versa, where people from the upper class end up getting shot down into the lower classes. He believes that social mobility of this kind, mobility across different social groups, is something that is not something that is necessary for a just society, is not something that ought to take place within a just society, and so people should be staying, uh, should stay essentially in the classes in which they are born. There are a few implications that can be drawn from this understanding that Socrates 
exhibits. So firstly, he states that both men and women exist in this class, uh, and this class he describes as guardians and auxiliaries, um, showing a somewhat progressive inclination, to especially in that of Greek society. Um, so what Socrates is doing here is um, showing that he's somewhat of a feminist in regard to Greek society, arguing that Men and women can both exist in this guardian and auxiliary class and that it is not something that is necessarily gendered in any uh, specific way. Uh, and if you know anything about Greek society at the time, you would know that women are considered to be uh, second class citizens um, in any in every regard. Uh, so this is actually quite a progressive um, inclination that we have from Socrates. Those were members um, who are members of this class are also required to undertake extensive education in a number of different subjects, including that of literature, music and gymnastics. So he doesn't just say that people who are born to rule ought to just be automatically given the opportunity to rule. They have to be trained to rule. They have to be given extensive education. They have to be given extensive knowledge and expertise and physical training to be able to rule within a, uh, within a just society. He also suggests that it's not all um, fun and games for those who rule and live in the upper class of the society because those who rule while also having to undertake extensive education have to um, be uh, abstinent essentially they're not allowed to marry they're not allowed to own property they're not even allowed to touch money according to Socrates they have to stay above all of these um, more materialistic uh, goals and traits and aspirations within Greek society they have to stay away from all those things because they are to rule they are not people who are to um, get involved in all of these uh, what we would maybe describe as hedonistic um, parts of life you shouldn't be able to marry you shouldn't be able to own property you shouldn't even be able to touch money so the reason why this is the case is because provisions will be given to them in exchange for the role that they play in society essentially they are born into a job they have the job of being able to rule uh, within society and so it's not something that is necessarily a privilege that they have to uh, undertake but it is something that is, is a job it is a role that they are required to take within society so continuing our understanding of justice it doesn't seem to be a particularly uh, fruitful or apt or even desirable state for society if we were to look at it through the lens of our modern analysis of the state. It is a particularly poor and dire state of society. But the point that Socrates is making is not to create a new constitutional settlement for society. He's not, he's not being tasked with the role of creating a constitution for Athens, for example or even to prescribe the desired political foundations of said society. What he is actually doing, if we remember back to earlier on, he is trying to explain the nature of justice within individuals. The aim here is to explain on an individual level what justice is, and to challenge the perspective that was presented by the brothers of Plato. He called them incompetent, if you remember back a few minutes ago. And Socrates only expanded this into the view of the city-state, to better explain the ideas to the brothers of Plato. He didn't need to expand this to the city-state, but because he believed them to be incompetent and unable to understand, he wanted to show from a more macro perspective the view of justice by ex expanding it to the idea of the city-state. And so while this may be the case, Plato does in later books start to discuss the concept of political society and the ideal constitutional settlement. So we... Even though this is the, 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 the role of Socrates within this dialogue, what Plato is now then going to do is start to discuss the concept of political society. In later books, he stated that there is a superior type of constitutional framework, as well as a number of inferior types of constitutional settlements. So the superior constitution is that of the aristocracy or monarchy. According to Plato, according to Socrates as well, the idea of a perfect society of a perfectly just society is one of aristocracy or monarchy where there is a select few who are born to rule over the rest of society this is where we can draw some ideas relating to the idea of the philosopher king within plato's dialogues the idea that people ought to be born into uh, into the position of rulers and that those people ought to again be subject to extensive and rigorous training in order to be the best they can be at ruling within society <laughs> 
He then outlines a number of inferior types of constitution. So, for example, democracy, which is the idea that those who are uh, able to rule or have a, a say in society have to be able to own property. That is what a democracy relates to. Oligarchy, the idea of rulership by a number of select oligarchs. Democracy, which we know to be the concept of the people ruling, the idea of power to the people. That's what the word democracy means in the uh, Greek translation, democratia, uh, people power. And then despotism, which is just the essential uh, ideas of dictatorship and totalitarianism. And it is argued that, according to Plato, the ways in which we get these inferior types of political settlements are actually using um, uh, through different um, kinds of virtues. Okay, And we have these different types of constitutional settlements because of a lack of cardinal virtues. It is only with all of the cardinal virtues that Plato ascribes that we lead to uh, and we get the idea of the perfect society, the perfect political settlement, that being monarchy or aristocracy. So the cardinal virtues that Socrates specifically outlines are fortitude, wisdom, justice and temperance. So according to uh, this theory, the other four types of, comp uh, of constitution, democracy, um, uh, oligarchy, democracy and despotism, all have less and less of these cardinal virtues, as one will eventually devolve into the other, with the final stage being that of despotism. So he says that aristocracy will devolve into democracy because there is a lack of wisdom. So if we take away wisdom within society, the perfect aristocracy devolves into democracy. Democracy will devolve into oligarchy, oligarchy sorry because there is a lack of fortitude so we take another cardinal virtue away and we get a a lesser type of society without temperance oligarchy will devolve into democracy so democracy is the existence of a society without wisdom fortitude and temperance and then finally without justice democracy will devolve into despotism so these are some of the basic ideas that we derive when we look at the concept of Plato's Republic. We will do an extra lesson looking at Plato's Allegory of the Cave, which is probably another aspect of, of, of his philosophy that's probably very important. But then we're going to start to move on to the next of the major political philosophers, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, next of the major ancient philosophers, that being that of Aristotle.